Harry Potter. I didn't expect the Dark Lord to become my best friend. Chapter 21. Dumbledore nodded slightly. Yes, Riddle is indeed not a good boy. He seemed to sigh and took another bite of lemon Olaf. Back then, just like I took you, I also took him away. I took him out of the orphanage and brought him to Hogwarts. Dumbledore said softly, as if he was afraid of waking him up. Like the people in the paintings on the wall behind him, he is a good student, the best kind of student that any teacher can think of. He is serious and diligent. Although his family is poor, he works very, very hard. At the same time, he also shows his strong talent. He is extremely talented, especially in the transfiguration class, where he shines. Sir Prius nodded. Ah, may I ask a question, sir? Dumbledore indicated with his eyes that Serples could ask whatever he wanted. Why did you bring Brother Riddle back, and why did you bring me back? Serples asked, tilting his head, looking like a pitiful and innocent child, I don't understand. Mr. Dumbledore glanced at him and was silent for a moment before laughing, that's a good question. Take him away because his magical talent has been revealed and because of a prophecy, he was really explaining, but only Dumbledore himself knew how much of the explanation was true and false. The prophecy told me, Riddle is homeless and I need to find him. Sepples noticed his wording, abandoned. Whose blood is brother Riddle? Dumbledore nodded. Yes, he does have an extraordinary life experience, but I can't say who his parents are. Quote. His eyes then fell on Sepulus's face. The reason why I went back to pick you up is for the same reason. You and Riddle should also be inextricably linked. Oh, Sepulus nodded, I must have benefited from Brother Riddle, otherwise I would still be in the orphanage. Dumbledore shook his head and said it was not the same thing, Riddle did some wrong things in the early years. If you confess to others that you have a relationship with Riddle, you may have to live a life of being yelled at and killed. Life, so it was my idea to pick you back up. He smiled, I also sent you to Grindelwald. Although he has a bad temper, he has given you a layer of gold. Even if something goes wrong in the future, it won't be too bad. Sir Prius's mind was spinning very quickly, and he knew what Dumbledore meant when he said, Ah, sir, he is my benefactor. This means that it belongs to him, so don't make a mistake in recording the account. Sure enough, Dumbledore did not deny Sir Prius's words of, Benefactor, he just still smiled with kindness in his eyes. You are a good boy, he said. Have you seen Professor Quirrell today? Sepulus blinked. I've seen it before. Did it involve Quirrell again? He tilted his head, so Quirrell belongs to Mr. Dumbledore. But he didn't finish his words, he just raised his face, still looking innocent. Professor Quirrell bumped into me this morning. He felt embarrassed and sent me to the classroom, I got lost on the way and took a detour. There are quite a few circles. Dumbledore said, Oh and looked at Serples with a heavy gaze, is there anything else you want to say to me? Sepulus blinked in confusion, has anything else happened around you recently? Dumbledore asked him patiently, anything is fine, you can tell me. Anything, Sepulus pursed his lips, what has happened to him recently that deserves Dumbledore's attention and curiosity? Perhaps only the little Tom Riddle who appears in the diary. But for some reason, Sepulus didn't want to tell Dumbledore about it, not at all. It's nothing, Serples said at last, I don't think anything happened around me, maybe the classmates around me don't like me very much, but I don't think it's a big deal. Dumbledore didn't ask any more questions, he just crossed his desk and patted Serpius on the shoulder. You are a smart boy, Serples, he said with a serious look, go back, you still have classes. Serpius nodded, jumped off the chair, thanked Mr. Dumbledore for the lemon sorbet, and then turned around and left along the original path. Dumbledore watched silently from his chair as Serple's back disappeared around the corner of the statue stairs. What do you think, Albus, a portrait on the wall asked, do you really think this is the reincarnation of Riddle? I never thought so, Dippet, Dumbledore replied briskly, I just got the news a few days ago that Riddle appeared in the Albanian forest, and it was basically confirmed that he is now on the back of Quirrell's head, why do you think that child is the reincarnation of Riddle? But you still doubt him, the portrait said. We have to doubt. Dumbledore admitted generously and happily, that he appeared in the orphanage where Riddle had stayed, and he was very similar to him, we all know that Riddle is not dead, 
and we also know that he he is still dormant just to make a comeback, so he has to be more careful. Maybe this kid can become an unexpected opponent of Riddle. You have to be careful, Albus. Although Grindelwald won't say it, he likes this child very much. The portrait was silent for a moment and then warned. What are you talking about, Dippet? You also want to eat Lemon Olaf. Dumbledore narrowed his eyes. Ah, Lemon Olaf is indeed the most delicious ice cream, I will go to Hogsmeade later. Buy some to keep. Serples didn't know that there was such a conversation in the principal's office after he left. He just left along the stairs, ready to find where his next class was, but when he passed by the fourth floor, he still slowed down slightly and looked towards the restricted corridor that Quirrell had, accidentally, taken him to in the morning. Quirrell was probably not working for Mr. Dumbledore. Serples lowered his eyes and thought, then who was he working for, the grown-up Mr. Riddle? He looked away and was about to lift his feet to leave, but the stairs in front of him turned away by themselves. Serpolis. Okay, okay, you are noble and awesome on the stairs. You specialize in spinning and jumping to trick students into being late, right? Hello. Someone suddenly patted Serpris on the shoulder from behind, classmate, your face looks bad. Do you need help? Serpris turned around and met a handsome and concerned face. He was really handsome, so cool that Sepulus somersaulted and subconsciously took a step back, forgetting that the stairs behind him had just been moved. No, has there really been no teaching accident in Hogwarts for so many years? Are there really no students who stepped on the air and fell to their death? Sepulus was speechless for a moment as he leaned back. Why am I in free fall this year? But that handsome face quickly enlarged in front of his eyes. This handsome man pulled him and rubbed his head with concern, are you okay? This kind-hearted handsome boy is called Cedric Diggory, from Hufflepuff, third grade. Surprius's knowledge of Hufflepuff is indeed very little. In other words, this college has always been low-key and does not stand out in front of the public. What Sepulus learned was consistent with what the sorting hat said, Hufflepuff people are upright, loyal, tough and honest. However, Sepulus has also heard some unpopular rumors. They belittle Hufflepuff and call Hufflepuff a waste shelter. They believe that only students who are not good enough and cannot be admitted to the other three houses. Only then would it be picked up by Hufflepuff. Surprius felt that anyone who could say such a thing was an idiot. Please, how many people can be loyal and honest? You. This is an amazing quality, isn't it? The guy who says he doesn't like it must have never been beaten by society. After you have suffered a few years outside, you will realize how amazing it is to be loyal and honest. The handsome senior in front of him was a student of Hufflepuff, and Surprius immediately stood in awe of him. Thank you, senior, Sepulus said obediently, if it weren't for senior, I would have fallen. Cedric Diggory waved his hand, with a warm smile on his face, it's my fault. If I didn't scare you, you wouldn't back away, just call me Cedric. Hello, brother Cedric, Sepples winked, my name is Sepples. Then are you lost here? Cedric raised his hand and rubbed Serpra's head again, thinking that this junior is so good, do you need my help? He didn't know that Serpels was also thinking at this time, wow, this senior is so nice. The life in the orphanage is actually very monotonous. Although the children know each other, it is difficult to get to know each other because of various problems. Sometimes it is because he has received praise from his grandma, and tomorrow it is she who will be praised. Might have to be adopted. But there are twin brothers. They are very, very nice. They would share the snacks rewarded by their grandma with each other, do hard work together, and earnestly ask the kind-hearted people who came to adopt them to take them away together, so that they would not be separated as brothers. Sepulus is so envious, when he was being punished by his mama alone, when he was handing out leaflets on the street alone, when he was trying to figure out how to be adopted, and every time in the dead of night. It would be nice if I had a brother too. He would hug himself, Natasha on his knees, and look out the window quietly. If I had a brother, I wouldn't have to work so hard. So Serples looked at Diggory in front of him and lowered his eyes, thinking that it would be great if he also had such a brother. Cedric didn't know that Serples had so many twists and turns in his heart. He just thought that Serples was young and shy. He had a good personality and was enthusiastic. The children in the neighborhood liked to play with him. So he became very skilled in taking care of his younger brothers and sisters. 
Now seeing the way Serpris pursed his lips and lowered his head, he couldn't help but feel soft in his heart. He took out the candy from his pocket, peeled off the candy wrapper and handed it to Serples, the toffee I bought in Hogsmeade, want to eat a piece. He peeled them all and put them in front of Sepples. There was no reason for Sepples to refuse, so he took the candy and said thank you again. Cedric patted him on the shoulder and said that since there was no class yet, he would take Sepulus around the castle to get his bearings, okay. There are a total of 142 stairs in Hogwarts. Some are wide and large, some are narrow and small, some are very flat, some will deliberately jolt you and stagger you when you walk up, and some are fixed every week. Some of them lead to strange places on a certain day, and some of them lead to strange places anytime and anywhere, wandering around every five minutes. The stairs are not ordinary, and the steps at the top are also ordinary. Some steps will suddenly disappear by themselves. You have to remember when to lift your feet and jump over by yourself. Some steps will make strange noises when you step on them. You have to use your own mind to remember these, because it is impossible to use the portraits or armors in the corridor as a reference. Almost everything is moving on its own. The people in the portraits will visit each other to change residences, and the armors will also move. I can walk around by myself, maybe to make friends. It's not easy to remember these. Cedric held Sepulus's hand and looked at Sepulus's fair little face that looked up, but if you walk more and shop more, you will always be able to remember. Most of the classrooms are inside the castle, but Quidditch, care of magical creatures, and herbology classes are outside the castle. The place outside the castle is also very big, but it becomes dangerous after nightfall, especially behind the castle and the forbidden forest behind the Quidditch pitch. It is vast and vast. It is said that there is everything, and there are tens of thousands of students. Can't enter. Cedric patiently took Sepples around the castle, and then sent Sepples to the door of the History of Magic classroom. Okay, it's time for class. Pay attention to safety when walking up the stairs in the castle. Cedric rubbed Serpra's soft black hair again. It's still very dangerous if you fall. I have to lie in the hospital wing for a long time and drink very bitter medicine. Serprius nodded, then grabbed Cedric's robe as he was about to leave. What's wrong? Cedric turned around in a good temper, waiting for Serprius to speak. Can I see you again in the future, Brother Cedric? Serpolis said in a small voice, I, can I? He lowered his head and did not dare to look at Cedric's appearance. His voice was not loud and timid, which made people feel very distressed. How could a good man like Cedric be willing to reject him? Of course you can come to me. Cedric leaned over and rubbed Serple's head again, then took off the brooch from his chest and handed it to Serple's, it's almost time for class now, I have to leave first, but this is for you. You can take this to the door of the Hufflepuff lounge after class in the evening and show this to any Hufflepuff student. They will take you into the lounge and ask them to find me then. I'm coming to see you, okay. Sir Prius nodded vigorously, then bit his lip and showed a nice smile. Well, goodbye brother Cedric, I'll go find you tonight. Cedric also smiled and waved goodbye to him, then turned around and rushed to his class. Sepples held the brooch and stared at Cedric's back until the bell rang, and then he turned and entered the classroom. It doesn't matter if he doesn't have a brother, he can get one by himself, right? That Hufflepuff is so pitiful, Natasha's voice sounded under Serple's collar, you don't feel at ease at first glance. Why did he provoke such a evil star like you? Serpris didn't answer Natasha, but patted her head through her clothes. He still didn't sit with the people around him, so he found a corner near the door and nestled there. He originally thought that the classroom was stuffy and he could sit closer to the door more comfortably, but he didn't expect that the teacher was quite hypnosis in class. If Sepples hadn't sat at the door and woke up while the air was flowing, he felt like he would have fallen asleep. Simply because history of magic is the only course at Hogwarts taught by a ghost professor. It is said that Professor Binns fell asleep in the fireplace in front of the staff lounge, forgot to take his body with him when he went to class the next day, and did not realize that he had passed away, this is enough to prove that Professor Binns he was indeed quite old back then. And I have quite a lot of love for teaching. To become a ghost, you need to have a strong obsession. Professor Binns can become a ghost because of his obsession, so he is very, very worthy of respect. Even though his class was really boring, he just talked and talked in a monotonous voice, causing a lot of students in the room to fall asleep. After this class, it was the lunch break at noon. 
Hogwarts, homework was not heavy. There were only three classes a day for the first grade students. They had quite a lot of free time and were not busy. After class, Sepples went to the auditorium to eat. He didn't plan to find anyone to be a companion, but Draco took the initiative to find Sepples at the long table in the auditorium. When Blaze came to see me in the morning, I left first, Draco and Sepulus said. Originally, I planned to wait for you to come with me. He planned to wait for me to come with him, but he didn't. Sir Prius raised his eyes and looked at Draco, and just smiled, then let's go together tomorrow. I don't know the road very well yet, let's look for it together. Although he has no intention of actively looking for company, being alone is not a particularly good choice. Okay, Draco probably came here for this purpose, we have a defense against the dark arts class in the afternoon. I don't know how it will be taught. Sepulus gave a small smile in return. How to teach? The defense against the dark arts teacher may be a little stupid, and his class may be a disaster. It was indeed a disaster. When Serples walked into the classroom, he almost had his head smoked out. The room was filled with the smell of garlic, which made people want to die. Professor Quirrell himself stammered and explained that this was to be wary of a vampire he met in Romania. He was afraid that the vampire would come back to catch him. He also explained to the students who were laughing and curious about his big scarf that his scarf was a gift from an African prince to thank him for helping the prince get rid of the entanglement of the resurrected zombies. Of course, if he could vividly describe his previous experiences, he would surely be able to establish some prestige, but he was very nervous when he spoke and stuttered several times with every word, especially after seeing sepals. It was so awesome that it once made Sepulus wonder whether he was a vampire or a resurrected zombie. What did you do to Quirrell? Draco looked at the cowering Quirrell strangely, with confusion on his face. Sepulus tilted his head, indicating that he didn't know either. One class seemed to be a joke. This time, it was not just Surprius who doubted the school's teaching staff, but everyone began to doubt the teaching staff of Hogwarts. But it is said that it was not like this before. Blaze jumped in to explain at the right time. Professor Quirrell could have been called the proud man of heaven, Otherwise Dumbledore would not have hired him, but he later wanted to I went out for an expedition for my thesis, and something happened on the way, and then it happened like this. Dumbledore didn't say he was fired. Draco raised an eyebrow in disgust. Maybe it's hard to find teachers in the defense against the dark arts class. Blaze spoke again mysteriously, have you heard of a rumor that the mysterious man also wanted to stay in school and become a professor? It was the position of Professor of Defense against the Dark Arts, but in the end Dumbledore didn't keep him, so he put a curse on this position, no one could live well in this position. Surpris propped his chin up while listening to Blaze's news, and yawned silently. Sleepy, Draco asked thoughtfully. A little bit, Surples responded, I didn't sleep well last night. How about you go back and rest first? Draco actually reached out and helped take the book away from Surpolis' hand, I'll go back to deliver the book as well, shall we? Sepulus nodded, wondering what was going on. He didn't have this attitude yesterday, so why did he change his temper today? So he nodded slowly and walked side by side with Draco on the road to the college lounge. Do you think I'm fickle? To Sepulus' surprise, Draco took the lead in raising the topic. He raised an eyebrow at Sepulus and smiled, with many narrow smiles in his eyes, meaning. Sepulus pursed his lips cautiously, what? I never felt that way. Draco listened to Serpil's words and shrugged casually, if I were put in your shoes, I would probably feel that I am fickle, and even if I am wrong, I would feel that I am sick. He turned his head and found that no one was around, and even made a face at Serpris, you clearly promised to be friends with me when you were in Diagon Alley, but when you came to Hogwarts, you ended up being friends with me. My group of friends just hung out and ignored me, and now they suddenly show up again, it's really crazy. Sepulus raised an eyebrow. I didn't mean it, Draco shrugged again, the Holy 28 family is in a relatively average state now. This friendship must be maintained, and as a new blood, you may not be able to integrate quickly. Come in, you understand, right? I understand, Sepulus responded. If I didn't understand, I should have embarrassed you, but you see, I still smile happily at you, Draco. Surpris frowned. It's good that you are willing to tell me this. After all, you can also explain nothing to me, right? 
I know you really treat me as a friend, so it doesn't matter. Quote. Sincerity. How much is sincerity worth? It's just the best excuse everyone uses to push the blame. Draco sent Sepulus back to his dormitory. He seemed to be very satisfied with Serple's understanding, but Serple's didn't really care about Draco's closeness. He said goodbye to Draco at the door of the dormitory, and after closing the door of the dormitory, the smile on his face faded. Natasha got out of his cuffs and stuck her head out. Why do you feel that your life is harder than in the orphanage? At least you don't have to keep smiling like this in the orphanage. Surpris poked Natasha's head but didn't reply. How can there be such a comparison? At least he now has enough food and clothing, and has nothing to worry about. He yawned, sat down in front of the desk, touched the alarm clock and set a time, then turned around and fell into bed and fell asleep. Although Slytherin's lounge is located underground, or under the Black Lake, and is generally cold and damp, but everyone has a single room, and there is a fireplace in the single room, so this cold and dampness will not be reflected in the dormitory. Warm and warm, Sepulus went in and fell asleep. While Serples was sleeping sweetly in bed, the diary he placed on the table trembled twice, and the translucent figure of Tom Riddle appeared inside. He stood beside Serples' bed for a while, or rather floated for a while, staring at Serples' face quietly for a while, then raised his hand and touched his own face. Am I similar to him? Tom Riddle asked softly, asking Natasha who was sitting next to Serples' pillow. Natasha looked at Serples hesitantly, and then at the transparent ghost in front of her. If you ask me, this question is difficult to answer, but if you ask, it should be quite similar. Quote. Tom Riddle nodded. What did you do today? He was in class, and I dozed off in his pocket. It was quite boring. Natasha's tail flicked on the sheets, leaving a shallow pit. But he was quite happy, and so was I happy. Natasha looked at the transparent Tom Riddle in the sky, let him sleep. He is still a human cub. He has no energy in class after staying up all night, he pinches his palms under the desk. Tom Riddle nodded. Then I will go back to the diary first. When he is free at night, I will come back to him. Natasha flicked her tail to express her approval. So Sepples slept peacefully until the alarm clock rang. Then Sepples reached out from the bed and fumbled for a long time to knock off the alarm clock. So sleepy, he sleepily threw off the quilt and groaned, sitting up, feeling that his soul was still floating in the sky, I'm so sleepy. If you're really sleepy, just keep sleeping, Natasha said, seeing that Serples was reluctant to open his eyes. We're not in an orphanage now, and there won't be any nanny to wake you up if you stay in bed. You are in bed. But I'm not getting up just because of mommy. Serpris held on for a breath and went to the bathroom to wash his face and wake up. I have to eat at night, and I have to go brother Cedric has such a face in front of him, how can he sleep? You really went to find that pretty senior. Natasha was stunned for a moment, you are getting more serious when you see. I don't want to steal or rob, but I'm a bit lecherous. Serpolis put on his clothes again and his mind was much clearer. That's a gentle and handsome guy with a good temper. I want to hug his lap. He adjusted his collar and practiced his harmless smile again in front of the mirror. Will you come with me tonight? Or do you want to have a good rest in the dormitory? Then I'll definitely go with you, Natasha snorted, the boiled egg on your table is delicious, I want to eat it tonight. Waiting for you to come back in the evening. Tom Riddle in the diary suddenly appeared, with a poker face, and spoke to Serpris calmly. Seppel said, ah, and then pressed his temples. Yes, yes, and you, I had a little guess today, it may not be correct or not, you wait until I take a look around at night and see let's see if I can find any clues to confirm my suspicion. Tom Riddle nodded and went back to his diary without saying much. He's quite scary, isn't he? Natasha said, looking at the diary that was lying still and motionless. A little bit, Sepples agreed, but I think the first priority is that I still need to buy a new diary. If I continue to write in that diary, I will feel like I am writing on him. Painting makes me feel like a pervert. But you don't have an owl, Natasha poured cold water on Serples. Your owl was left with your father. I can borrow it. They don't all have owls, right? They generally refer to a group of classmates around them. Regarding the matter of raising pets, the four colleges have different ideas. What stands out about Slytherin's pets is the word, expensive. They are as harsh on their pets as they are on themselves. 
The bloodline must be pure, the appearance must be outstanding, and it is best to be rare and rare. Therefore, the pets on Slytherin's long table are untouchable species at first glance. Sir Prius glanced at the falcon that brought Draco the newspaper, but in the end he didn't ask to borrow it. He felt that every single hair of the falcon was worth more than his Natasha. Hufflepuff is the opposite of Slytherin, their pet can be anything. A cat that was abandoned because of old age, a mouse that had its leg broken due to an accident, an owl that has nowhere to go because it has reached retirement age, or other unwanted little things from other people's homes, maybe their pets because they can't bear to let them go. These little lives just die, so they choose to take good care of them. Ravenclaw, there seems to be no pets on the long table of Ravenclaw. This academy that loves learning seems not even willing to raise owls. They use the rentable owls from the owl loft to raise them themselves, just for themselves. Don't waste time on pets. Maybe they also feel that ordinary pets are not worth their time. Anyway, Serples feels that if one day he tells Ravenclaws that they can raise ghost kittens, a large number of Ravenclaws will definitely rush to raise them. But they may not be able to grab Slytherin, because Slytherin has the ability to make money. As for Gryffindor, they seemed to have everything, but their long table was so noisy that Serples couldn't tell what they had. The sorting hat is really powerful. Serples looked back to see Natasha swallowing a hard-boiled egg. Every house has its own unique characteristics. In the end, Sepulus chose to ask the Olary. Which Olary are you going to? The price will drop so much, you can use mine, Draco asked when he saw that Serples was about to leave, and then he became anxious, you want to buy something what to buy, and which store. Shop, I might have a membership. Sir Prius blinked. At this time, a girl sitting opposite Draco suddenly smiled softly and looked at Serples with a crooked eyebrow. You don't have to be polite to him, Serples. The intimacy between her words made Sepulus stunned. Draco has memberships in almost all the stores in Diagon Alley. If we usually buy something, we always ask him if he has a membership first. The girl smiled brightly, don't take it seriously, Sepulus, there are many benefits that membership can bring, and you will definitely not suffer any loss. Quote. Only then did Serpulus remember who this person was, Daphne Greengrass, a well-known rebellious daughter of the Greengrass family, but she was very good at coaxing people, so even if she had done something my son went a little too far, and everyone in the family indulged her. This is not because the family loves her and they indulge her, but because Daphne is good at talking and can bring glory to the family. Aristocratic families are more snobbish than ordinary families. Is that so? I don't know much about it. Fortunately, Daphne, you reminded me, since everyone said it so sincerely, but I just want to buy a diary. Isn't this a bit too much fanfare? Hey, Daphne said with a smile, as for notebooks, how can a diary alone be enough? Look, you have to prepare homework books for each subject, right? You have to prepare notebooks for daily practice, right? Ink pens, pen nibs, don't you have to buy all these things? Her beautiful eyes flashed. Besides, don't you still want to write a letter to the guy in Austria? I heard that guy has a very discerning eye, so why don't you prepare some pretty tricks to match it? Sir Prius looked at Daphne and thought, wow, it would be a bit of a disgrace to not go into business with this eloquence. It makes sense, Serpolis nodded, in this way, I do have a lot of things that need to be bought new. Before he finished speaking, Draco said, yeah, and then waved his hand, buy them all, buy new ones, and ask Scud's stationery store to send you a copy of all the new products. You can choose what you like and let them send more. Sepulus was shocked. This, 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 is not good. There's nothing wrong with it. It was Theodore who held down Sepul's hand. Draco has money, let him spend it. Serpolis, is this what it should be? Is this what you rich people? Serpreus thanked him politely, and then bowed his head to eat. Who says money can't buy friends? Who can stand to spend money on others like this? Suddenly, Blaze, who had been silent, said, hum, attracting everyone's attention. Look at this, Blaze unfolded the newly arrived newspaper and pointed out a certain article in it to them, Gringotts trespassing. That was the headline of the Daily Prophet, occupying almost the entire front page. Gringotts break in incident report. 
The investigation into the illegal break-in at Gringotts on July 31st is still ongoing, and it is generally believed that it was the work of an unknown dark wizard. The goblins of Gringotts reiterated today that nothing was stolen. The underground vault that had been searched by the intruders had actually been drained earlier that day. A Gringotts goblin spokesperson said this afternoon, There is no comment on what is stored in the vault, and it is best not to interfere in this matter. Someone stole something from Gringotts. Blaze's words contained mostly admiration. You are really brave, Draco snorted, are the guards and Gringotts so lax now? Any mouse can go in and take a look. I want to go back and tell my father to take the family's treasury. A few have been moved. Theodore glanced at the newspaper for a few times and then looked away. Daphne and Miss Pansy of the Parkinson family across the street were not interested in this report at all. They ordered the magazine of the Extraordinary Wizard. Sepulus' eyes stayed on the newspaper for a moment, and then he looked away. What he was thinking at the time was that this matter had nothing to do with him, so why should he be curious about this kind of thing? In fact, Sepulus is still young. He didn't know there was something called a flag. After dinner, he originally planned to go to the Hufflepuff Lounge to see Cedric. After all, he had to trick someone into recognizing him as his brother, so he had to be more attentive and feel more present. But when he returned to the lounge after dinner and was about to rest for a while before going out, he suddenly felt like the world was spinning. It was literally spinning. He felt that every step he took was in an unknown place. His eyes were in chaos for a moment, and then he fell to the ground. When he did, he thought he was falling to the ground. When he woke up, he was lying on the sofa upright with his hands covering his abdomen. He looked like a dignified corpse that could be buried soon. Sepulus. What's going on? Serples rubbed his painful head and sat upright. Did you get me up here, Natalia? But he felt that it couldn't be the case. No matter how smart Natasha was, she was just a snake and how could she put him on the sofa? Natasha looked at Sepulus with a complicated expression and shook her head. Then who came in and helped me up? Serpolis thought this was the most likely scenario, but Natasha still shook her head. You walked back and sat down by yourself. Natasha said. Sepulus, it's true. Tom Riddle from the diary appeared in a leisurely manner, then looked at Serpolis and seriously testified to Natasha, when you came back, you fell to the ground and fell unconscious for a while. Natasha Tasha was very nervous and thought about going next door to call someone, although I don't think she could really call someone as a snake. He paused and continued, but soon you stood up, but didn't say anything. You stood up and left. You didn't respond to Natasha or me calling you. You just went out. Natasha was very anxious and could only crawl on your neck and strangle you. Your face turned pale and you didn't stop. He watched Sepulus's expression change dramatically, and then he made a rather playful and juvenile gesture. Let Natasha tell you the rest. I couldn't follow you out, but she actually put her arm around your neck and followed you out. You can see there is a circle of green around your neck now. She almost strangled you. Surprius's expression suddenly became wonderful. He raised his hand and touched his neck. As expected, it stung badly. He got up and looked in the mirror and took a look. Sure enough, there was an obvious bruise. It seemed that Natasha had put in a lot of effort when she him. You didn't react without any effort. Natasha looked at Serpolis rubbing the marks on his neck and felt a little guilty. I was just afraid that something would happen to you, so I put in a little effort. Who knows, you are completely unresponsive as if you were possessed by a ghost. Sepulus was stunned. What's this, the ghost attack technique? He retracted his hand and lowered his head to look at Natasha, and Natasha flicked her tail. Just, we called you, but you didn't respond at all. You stood up and wanted to go out. It was hard to choke you. Even if you wanted to go out, you couldn't be persuaded no matter what. Natasha snorted, Tom has no way to follow you. Let's go, I'll hang on to you and see where you're going, guess where you're going. Did I go out? Surpresa's eyes widened slightly, wondering why I didn't know, but seeing the way Natasha and Tom nodded, he must have indeed gone out. There is no need for them to play tricks on her because of this, and Natasha has been with him for so many years, so she will not be disadvantageous to him. Surprius then coughed dryly and touched the water glass nonchalantly, then, where did I go? Would you like to guess where you went? Natasha was very calm, and she could still joke with sepals or something. 
Sir Prius took a sip of water and felt that his throat felt better. It can't be the restricted area where Professor Quirrell took me on a side road this morning, right? Natasha said nothing. Sepples turned his head stiffly to look at her. Natasha still said nothing. Can't you? Serple's expression was slightly stiff. Am I so unlucky? Natasha looked away, and Tom answered. It's so bad. Natasha said you went straight to the restricted area, but it wasn't that kind of rampage. You still knew how to avoid people in the middle. Tom's expression was also slightly complicated. It seems that you have a very, very strong purpose. Quote. So it can be ruled out that I am sleepwalking. Sir Prez's expression was bitter. This doesn't sound like a good thing. But you haven't spoken a word, Natasha continued. You are like a mute. You just move forward without saying a word. But the door to the restricted area, remember, was locked in the morning. Natasha added. I remember this, Sepulus said to himself. He even looked back to see that there was a huge lock on the door, which was firmly placed on the narrow door. It's no wonder that the door is not locked this time. I are you in? Natasha was silent again. Serpolis's face looked really bad this time. I went in. I just went in like that. Didn't anyone come out to knock me out and stop me? Calm down, calm down. Natasha put her arm around Serpolis again. She was as cold as a snake, which made Serpolis wake up a little. There is no one in the small door that I just entered. People saw what you were doing. Serpolis said, Did I mean this? I, I didn't mean it this way. What's in there? Tom asked Natasha, then turned to smile at Serpris, we were chatting for a while when you were awake, but we haven't gotten to this point yet. Quote. The corners of Sepulus' eyes twitched. Just, the door was opened a small crack, and it was unlocked. Then Serpris hid behind the door, then opened the door wider, and looked inside. Anyway, I saw someone spinning back and forth inside. The big dog walked away. A big dog circling back and forth. Sepples was confused, and suddenly there was a stinging pain in his head. He was not prepared, and was caught off guard by the stinging pain. Then he fell to the ground with his forehead covered. Immediately afterwards, a memory suddenly appeared in his mind. He was still him. He clearly saw himself falling, then stood up, avoiding the students and professors around him. His goal was very clear, and he went straight to the area on the fourth floor known as the restricted area. He also clearly saw himself looking sideways behind the door panel. He saw a big dog pacing back and forth inside. He also saw that the big dog had three heads. He even clearly remembered that he saw the big dog. There was a good, uncovered trapdoor under his neck. He remembered very clearly, remembering that he saw everything clearly, and then he walked back, sat down on the sofa neatly, and closed his eyes. Are you okay, Sepples, Sepples? When he came back to his senses, it was Natasha who was slapping Sepples in the face with her tail. It's okay, Sepulus reached out and grabbed the tip of Natasha's flailing tail, I feel like a memory suddenly appeared in my mind, the memory I didn't have just now. He pressed his temples and exhaled, this school has much bigger problems than I thought. Tom frowned and looked at him, what's going on? Do you want to find someone to ask? Let's not ask for now, Sepulus shook his head. I'm just like you, the people around me are not relatives or friends, so asking questions always feels unreliable. I'm waiting and watching. He paused and then spoke with a little hesitation. I always feel that someone deliberately let me know what is behind that door. I saw that there was a trap door under the big dog. Maybe I should try to get past the big dog and look under the trap door. Tom looked at Serples and nodded, please be safe. But let's leave that to tomorrow. Serpolis pressed his temple again, Hogwarts has a curfew, and I have no idea of challenging the school's lower limit on the first day of school I'll go to bed today, and I'll go to the library tomorrow. He propped up his chin and looked at Tom Riddle, who had an expressionless poker face on his side, I don't think there will be any traces of your seven years at Hogwarts. I'll look for the alumni list or something. I will definitely know what happened to you, and maybe I will know why you are here. Tom responded, thank you. What's there to be thankful for? Serpris smiled with a crooked look on his face, it's fate that we met now. Speaking of which, Dumbledore found me today and said that we two are very similar, I think we are maybe there is really some relationship between them, maybe you are some kind of relative of mine when you grow up, right? Tom looked away slightly embarrassed. It's better to say goodbye. 
If we really have something to do with each other, if I send you to an orphanage, my life will be miserable. Serples didn't sleep well that night. He kept hearing a voice talking to him repeatedly. That voice told him that they were a family and that Serples must help him. Then they would the family can be reunited and live a good life. That night, Sepulus slept tossing and turning. When he woke up, he stared at the two huge dark circles under his eyes and had a splitting headache. You look terrible, Tom Riddle sat at the desk and looked at him. I heard you turning back and forth at night. Do you have nightmares? It's a nightmare, Sepulus pressed his head. I dreamed that someone called me and said some nonsense about us being a family, maybe they moved to a new place suddenly. I'm not familiar with it, so I was in a bad state and had a nightmare or something. Your body is important, Tom frowned slightly, if you want to achieve something, your body is the most important thing. Surpris didn't expect Tom to warn him like this. He was slightly stunned for a moment, and then scratched his head in embarrassment. I know, um, thank you, brother Tom. Tom said, yeah, get ready and go to class. Hogwarts may not be a safe place. Don't be alone. Come back before dark. He gave instructions in a decent manner, quite like an older brother, which made Sepples's nose sore. He vaguely agreed, packed up his things for class, and took Natasha out. You don't want a bunch of brothers, do you? Natasha looked at Serple's ears turning red. You have to know that Tom is a ghost. He will still be a ghost when you are 70 or 80 years old. How can you still call him brother? Serpola's face heated up when he said this to Natasha, and he touched his nose awkwardly. What a shame, you don't know me yet. I just hope that someone will care more about me. It doesn't matter if his ghost grows up, anyway. The diary I brought out is my ghost. He raised his hand and patted his face to calm down the heat, then raised his hand and knocked on Draco's room door. Yesterday we agreed to go to class together, so he just came to call someone. Draco yawned and came out to see him. He had already packed up and looked pretty. I usually get up early at home, but at that time the house elf called me early. He probably hadn't woken up either, his eyes were slightly red, it's really different outside than at home, it's a lot of inconvenience. Sepulus saw that he was really sleepy, so he thought for a while and gave him some advice, then I'll wake you up in the future. Slytherin's student dormitories are all single rooms, and each room has a key. Serples asked Draco for the spare key to his room, saying that he would wake Draco up every day when he got up. Getting up early was not a problem for Serples. He always got up early. Even if it was a rare occasion that he couldn't get up, Natasha was a snake who couldn't stand the noise of the alarm clock and would rush over and slap Serples with her tail. Yes Natasha is a grumpy sister too. The first class today is the class of Professor Snape, the Dean of Slytherin. It is said that Professor Snape is very fierce and likes to take points off people the most. However, this fierce Dean also has a label as to protect shortcomings. This may not be a good thing for students in other houses, but for students in Slytherin House, this is a great blessing. Today's class is with Gryffindor again, which is conceivable. After all, as two houses with quite different numbers, they sit together more evenly. The potions class is held in an underground classroom. I have to say that the castle of Hogwarts is really big. There are rooms everywhere and doors everywhere. Although some doors are not real doors, the door panels may have some cracks. Bite. The underground classroom was much colder than the main building of the castle above. Draco had known that it would be like this, so when he went out, he specifically reminded Sepples to wear an extra scarf before going out. The room is also very eerie. There are glass jars placed along the wall, and various specimens are placed in the jars. You look at the various eerie things soaked in the green liquid, and you it will feel much colder. Professor Snape started by calling the roll, and Sepulus knew that the dean was a strict person, it's not the normal teacher who calls the roll, everyone is just a fool. But when Professor Snape read Harry's name, he stopped. Oh, yes, yes, he whispered, with an unreadable look on his face. Harry Potter, our new, famous character. His words were more or less yin and yang, causing Harry Potter to feel nervous and embarrassed, as well as a wave of ridicule from the Slytherin students. The Godfather doesn't like Potter, Draco whispered in Serple's ear. The Godfather thinks Potter is just a loser with no name. Sepulus nodded silently. Professor Snape's pupils were dark, but this blackness had an indifferent hollowness, like two dark tunnels. 
You are here to learn the precise science and rigorous craftsmanship of potion preparation. His voice was very soft, very soft, not much higher than a whisper next to your ear, but everyone quieted down in this soft and excessive voice, and everyone sat down obediently, no one dared to speak out, everyone listened to Professor Snape's voice in silence. Since there's no silly wand waving here, some of you may think this isn't magic. I don't expect you to really understand the beauty of the slowly simmering crucible emitting white smoke and wafting out bursts of fragrance, nor do I expect you to understand the fragrance flowing into the blood vessels, which is so exciting and confusing. Wonderful magic. Even if I can teach you to increase your reputation, brew glory, and even prevent death. His gaze coldly swept over every student present. It was not Sepulus's illusion. He felt that when Professor Snape looked at them, the expression on his face could be called, impatient. But there must be one thing, that is, you are not the stupid fools I often meet. Well, Sepples decided to retract his preamble, maybe not out of impatience, but also decided that the students in front of him were all idiots. Potter, said Professor Snape suddenly, what will I get if I add Narcissus root powder to wormwood infusion? He asked suddenly, and Serples turned to look at Harry. Almost everyone turned to look at Harry, but Harry's face was blank, and he looked at Ron next to him, both of them looked very eye-catching. Stare. The confusion on Harry's face couldn't be faked. Serples turned his eyes around and found that there were also many people who looked quite guilty and were secretly flipping through books with wandering eyes. Oh, it seems they don't have a good habit of previewing their homework before class. Serpris thought silently, then looked to the side, where Granger was sitting on the other side of Gryffindor. Her hands were raised high, with, ask me, ask, written all over her face. I asked me. I don't know, sir. Harry finally said hesitantly, and Professor Snape looked at him and snorted. It seems that fame doesn't mean everything, does it? His eyes passed among the students, and he deliberately did not call Granger who raised his hand high, but suddenly called Serpolis' name. Grindelwald, do you know? Well, you can get a very powerful sleeping potion, commonly known as the water of life and death. Professor Snape was shocked by Sir Prius's sudden question, but after all, he had read almost all the potion's textbooks. It's a dog-eared book, and I'm not bragging. He doesn't think it's a problem for him even with first-grade potions. Professor Snape's gaze lingered on Sepulus' face for a while. It was an indescribable gaze, but he quickly moved away. Let's try again, Potter. If I asked you to find me a bazaar, where would you look for it? Professor Snape once again pointed the finger at Harry. The Godfather also has a bit of a preconception about you. Draco whispered in Serple's ear again, but as you have learned, he likes smart students, Potter will be in trouble. Sepples glanced at Draco. Draco's attention was focused on Harry Potter. With a gloating smile, Sepples raised his eyebrows, and said in his heart, you know your godfather has preconceived ideas, you, you didn't take the initiative to remind me to prepare for my homework. If I hadn't answered the question just now, would you have laughed at me too? But then I thought about it, Draco didn't have this obligation, so he could only think that he, Harry Potter, had bad luck. At this moment, he suddenly remembered that Harry had lived at his aunt's house for the first eleven years, and he couldn't help but admire Dumbledore's foresight. If Harry was brought up in an environment where everyone was paying attention to him, he might look like someone else, and he might go crazy due to too much pressure. But Harry still didn't know. He looked very, very embarrassed. He seemed to want to look directly into Professor Snape's eyes, but he couldn't succeed for long. I don't know, sir, he said at last. Grindelwald, Professor Snape once again threw the question to Serples, once again ignoring Granger's raised arms. Goat's stomach, Sir Prius replied. What's the purpose? Professor Snape stared at him and continued to ask. It can detoxify. Thupples paused and added, and Professor Snape seemed slightly satisfied and looked away. It seems that some people still know how to read. Do you think, a thousand magic herbs and mushrooms, is boring, Potter? You don't want to read it. Professor Snape's voice was cold, with a hint of Gootsy taunted, Come on, Potter, tell me, what is the difference between Econodum scapularis and Econodum wolfsbane? Hermione raised her hand higher, she even stood up, stretched out her hand straight, pointing only at the ceiling of the underground classroom. I don't know, Harry seemed a little disappointed, but I think Hermione knows the answer, and so does Sepples. Why don't you ask them? Professor Snape's face darkened, 
and he sternly asked Granger to sit down, and then pointed at Sepples, who stood up and answered the question with great discernment, they are the same plant, collectively called Econodum. Quote, Professor Snape looked at Harry, and then sneered, Potter, because you contradicted the teacher, Gryffindor will deduct five points for this, and Slytherin will add ten points. His voice was drawn out, soft, but gratuitously creepy, why don't you write this all down? Instantly the rustle of parchment and quills filled the classroom. Everyone was afraid that they would be unlucky next, so they all bowed their heads and scratched on the parchment. Professor Snape calmly directed the students to operate, led them to understand the utensils and techniques, and then asked everyone to work in pairs. Group and make a simple potion to treat boils. Draco and Sepples were in a group. They could be regarded as Professor Snape's darlings. When almost everyone else was scolded, they survived completely and even whispered a few words occasionally. Professor Snape doesn't care. My godfather hates stupidity, Draco whispered, while he was adjusting the temperature of the cauldron in his hand. He was the one who initiated my potion from a young age, I didn't think you would be too bad. I've read a lot of books, said Serpolis, who was cutting slugs with gloves on. Potions are really interesting. And if you make a good bottle, you can sell it for a lot of money. But he didn't say this, he just handed the cut slugs to Draco and asked Draco to cook them. A set of procedures flowed smoothly, and there was a little tacit understanding for no reason. Serples looked at Draco with a lot of eyes. I've peeled the porcupine quills, and you can add them directly after you finish cooking them. Serpris greeted Draco and walked away from his seat, preparing to get something from the material cabinet. But suddenly there was an acidic green smoke coming out of the ground, and there was a loud hissing sound. It was Neville Longbottom of Gryffindor, whom he had met before on the ship when he was a student. He burned through his cauldron and spilled all the potion in it, splashing everywhere. Sepulus lowered his head and looked at the sizzling holes burned through his robe. He took a few steps back, turned to look at Draco, and said thank you sincerely. Why are you thanking me? Draco turned down the heat of the cauldron, then turned to look at Sepulus with a little doubt. Thank you for the clothes you bought. Serpolis shook the robe on his body and showed Draco the burned holes. The clothes you bought are strong and thick, if I had bought them myself, I guess I will choose the economical one, so I won't just burn through my clothes. Draco suddenly realized and said, Oh, what's the matter? Come with me and I will give you the best food, clothing and expenses. He was really wealthy, so he immediately decided to place an additional order at noon and buy some new robes for Serples. Professor Snape deducted five points from Gryffindor for this accident, and then cursed even more fiercely in the next hour. Serples didn't think the other classes were very interesting. Maybe the charms class was okay. Professor Flitwick, the head of Ravenclaw, actually taught quite well, but Serples's starting point was slightly higher. It was Grindelwald who first explained the curse to him, and no one else explained it as well as Grindelwald. Serples spent all the time after class in the library. Although there was nothing in Hogwarts that could restrict his studies, he still worked hard for the life of Tom Riddle. However, after several searches, there was no information. Instead, he used it as a refresher and a new breakthrough in the study of three-headed dogs. Three-headed dogs will fall into a deep sleep after hearing music. Serpolis collected the book, turned around and went back to the dormitory. When Tom Riddle saw Serpolis coming back, he came out of his diary and greeted him, Are you back so early today? I made a discovery today. Serpolis smiled at him. Serpolis threw his school bag on the sofa. His time at Hogwarts actually passed quite quickly. He studied hard and studied hard. Now every teacher in every subject likes him. Even Professor Snape after seeing the potions that Sepples tried to make, he also had a good impression of Sepples, and Draco even told Sepples in private that Professor Snape felt that Sepples C seems to have some talent, so that's a compliment. But he has been at Hogwarts for almost half a month, and he has not even gone to the Hufflepuff lounge to look for Cedric once. He is also in a hurry, okay. Don't delay for a few more days, people will forget about him. Both are clean. Fortunately, Tom obviously knew that Serples was worried about something. He turned his head and glanced at the clock on the wall, it's so early today. You can go see your Hufflepuff friend later. Quote. Serpris smiled brightly at Tom. Yes, but let's not talk about him first. I found information about the three-headed dog in the library today. 
he showed Tom the excerpt from the book. The three-headed dog will fall into a deep sleep after hearing the music. You see, there is a note here. It doesn't matter if it sounds unpleasant, as long as it is music. Sepples laughed, then I can give it a try. I can playing the harmonica is not very good, but I think I might be able to do it if I fool around with it. Tom glanced at Sepples, thinking that you were taking a risk, but he blinked, take me with you. Sepples was stunned for a moment, then after thinking for a moment, he nodded, maybe I really need to trouble you, after all, I don't know what is going on under the trap door, and I really need your help to investigate. Tom nodded and smiled softly. The smile is quite pretty. Surprius looked away hastily. I'll go to Hufflepuff in a while, Surprius stretched. I made some new discoveries today. I'll give myself a little break, but don't worry, I've found all the news about the three-headed dog. The information will definitely be found soon, don't worry. Tom nodded, not in a hurry, and turned back to his diary. Surprius also went back to bed for a short while. Seriously, Tom is a good, um, friend. Or maybe roommate too. He doesn't talk much, but the few words he occasionally says are quite reasonable and helpful. He is obviously a very good thinker, and he is usually a very good listener. When Surprise has something to say, he will listen quietly. Even if Natasha sometimes wants to share too much, Tom can still listen quietly. As a roommate, he lives in a diary, doesn't delay anything, takes up nothing, and has no personal hygiene to worry about. He is truly the best roommate imaginable. He could even wake up Surples. No, Surples thought about lying down for half an hour. When the half hour was up, Tom came over and told him to get up. Okay, then I'll leave first, Surples stood up to pack up, then took the badge that Cedric gave him and Natasha in his arms and went out. Before leaving, he didn't forget to give Tom the radio. Open. Tom was a ghost and couldn't read books or do anything by himself. Surples was afraid that he would be bored alone in the house, so he went to buy a radio so that Tom could listen to something to pass the time. Come back early, Tom said goodbye to Surples, leaning on the bookshelf. Don't be unsafe if it's too late. Sepulus nodded like a fool, and then left the gate of opening. Hufflepuff's lounge is not too far away from the Slytherin lounge. It turns a few stairs and then turns a corner, near the Hogwarts kitchen. Walk past the huge picture at the kitchen entrance. In the still life, you will find a pile of large barrels stacked in a dark stone trough on the right side of the corridor. Then Sepulus did not know the way. The entrance methods to the lounges of each college are not interoperable. Serpolis only knows the location roughly, but he doesn't know the specific entry method at all. So he squatted down silently beside the large barrels, curled up into a small ball, and prepared to block a Hufflepuff student from sneaking in. As a result, the Hufflepuff student next to him did not squat down, but Cedric himself did. Cedric came out of the Hufflepuff common room. He was walking very fast. Sepples didn't notice and didn't stop him. His goal was to stop someone who was about to enter. Unexpectedly, Cedric saw this person beside the wine barrel. He squatted down and took a few steps back. Sepulus, his voice sounded on the top of Sepulus' head, and there was more or less hesitation in the movement. Sepples raised his head in surprise, and what Cedric saw was that Sepples and the snake in Sepples' arms raised their eyes in confusion and confusion, with four eyes and two faces looking confused and pitiful. Merlin, I must be under too much pressure recently. How could I see confusion and pitifulness on a snake's face? Why are you here? Cedric pulled Sepulus up. I've been waiting for you for a long time and haven't seen you come to me. I thought you had forgotten about it. Sepples clutched the corner of his robe in embarrassment. Um, I'm sorry, Brother Cedric, I've been a little busy recently. In fact, he became nervous when he said the words, thinking that he was very busy. He was a first-year student, so theoretically he should be very busy. But Cedric didn't embarrass or ask questions, he just raised his hand and rubbed Surpris' hair again. I'll take you in first, and then I'll deliver something to the professor, are you free later? I'm going to the Quidditch field for training later, do you want to come and take a look? Cedric asked patiently. Sepulus nodded heavily, yes. Sepples followed Cedric, and Cedric turned sideways to show Sepples how to enter the Hufflepuff common room. That's it, Cedric held Surprius's hand, hit the second barrel from the bottom in the middle of the second row, knocking according to the rhythm of, Helga Hufflepuff, the door will open. 
Sepals was held by Cedric's hand and beat the rhythm. He watched in a daze as the lid of the barrel would rotate open, revealing a passage leading to the basement that could be climbed in. Remember the rules, Cedric told Serples. If you hit it wrong, vinegar will spray out of the bucket over there and splash you all over. Sepples nodded stiffly, indicating that he had remembered it, but after hesitating for a moment, he still spoke, doesn't it matter if you just tell me how to get in? The prefects of Slytherin had always warned them not to tell others the Slytherin lounge password. It doesn't matter, Cedric said very calmly, I believe you. The vat is connected to an earthen sloping passageway, and a short walk upwards leads to a cozy round low room, reminiscent of the shape of a badger. The room is dotted with pleasant honey yellow and black colors, with tables made of highly polished honey-colored wood and circular doors leading to the boys' and girls' dormitories respectively. Sir Prius tilted his head to reflect the dark green of Slytherin, and felt that the decoration here was more sunny and cheerful. No wonder the students in Slytherin felt mean and depressed, and there was no sunshine in the dormitory decoration environment. A variety of colorful plants and flowers make the Hufflepuff common room look sunnier. Various varieties of cacti are placed on wooden round shelves, and curved flowers are hung in copper-bottomed flower pots on the ceiling. Ferns and Vines Sepulus looked up at the hanging vines, which rolled up and swayed. That's when they say hello to you again, Cedric and Sepulus explained. Above the wooden mantelpiece is a portrait of Helga Hufflepuff, one of the four founders of Hogwarts, greeting her students with a small gold amphorae, the smile is also very sunny. The small round window was just flush with the ground, showing a pleasant scene at the foot of the castle, the green grass was rippled by the breeze, dandelions were scattered everywhere, and occasionally people could be seen passing by. Despite the low position of these windows, the entire room is still flooded with sunlight all year round. I like it here, Natasha poked her head out of Serple's pocket and commented, it's much more comfortable than the Slytherin common room, Salazar Slytherin certainly doesn't keep snakes. Every day in your lounge I feel like hibernating as soon as I leave the baking confines of the fireplace. Sepulus touched his nose sarcastically. Your pet snake is very lively. Cedric also saw the little snake emerging from Surprius' pocket. Is it poisonous? Be careful not to get bitten. Sepples nodded and was placed on the round armchair by Cedric. Wait for me here, I will be back soon. Surpolis naturally nodded his head, waited obediently in his position, and shrank himself into the sofa. Cedric looked at him and seemed to smile again, then stood up and left. The Hufflepuff lounge sofa looks like a pumpkin from a distance, but it feels very comfortable when you sit down in it. It's soft and comfortable. Although the armchairs in the Slytherin lounge are not bad, Sepulus just feels that this one is better. Hello, a polite voice sounded in Serples's ear. Surprius hurriedly raised his head from the armchair and saw a slightly familiar boy in front of him. Ah, Justin Finch Fletchley. He asked hesitantly. The boy's eyes lit up. It's me, long time no see, Sepples. Sepples was surprised by this sudden appearance and didn't know what to say for a moment. He had met this boy several times. They were in the same grade. Sometimes Slytherin's classes overlapped with Hufflepuffs, so they had only met a few times during class. But not a word was said. The reason why Serpolis remembered this boy was because his surname was Fanglili, and the orphanage had received a check from a well-wisher with this surname before. But why did he call himself so affectionately? You said it's been a long time no see. Have we met before? Hello, Surpris smiled at Justin Finch Fletchley with some confusion. Are you, do you want to see me if you have anything to do? Justin Finch Fletchley's smile froze at the corner of his mouth, and he seemed a little sad. You don't remember me. I met you before at the charity sale at the orphanage where you were. He frowned, and suddenly thought of something. I wore braces at that time. Do you remember? You thought I was also an orphan in another orphanage, and you gave me the cookies you made. He was a little more specific, and Serples followed his words and recalled it, and it took him a long time to successfully get the answer. Ah, you were the one who was frightened by Natasha. The memory returned, and Serpris remembered who the person in front of him was. It was a charity sale at an orphanage. To be honest, orphanages would organize a charity sale whenever they were short of money. But the time Surpris met Justin was a large-scale charity sale. There were a lot of people at that time, and many orphanages went there, people. Surples is sweet-tongued and can talk, so he was chosen by his grandma to join the team. 
It was noon when I met Justin, and everyone had gone to eat. Serples was left to look at the stall by his grandma. He was a little bored by himself, squatting behind the stall to tease Natasha with grass leaves and ended up shouting. A child of the same age as him saw it. The child was startled by Natasha who turned around and sat on the ground. In order to coax him not to talk about Natasha's existence outside, Sepples took cookies from his ration for Justin to eat. The number of cookies was fixed, and most of them had to be bought. Yes, you can't move casually. But the two of them still had a lot of fun that afternoon. Natasha hid herself and waited until Justin left before returning to Surpris. I really didn't recognize it. Surpris apologized to Justin sincerely, it has changed too much. I didn't expect it to be you at first. Justin also laughed. To be honest, after that time I went back and mentioned you to my parents. After all, I am an only child, and my parents agreed and said they could consider adopting you and me. As a companion, but when we went to your orphanage, we learned that you had been adopted. Quote. Sepples was obviously stunned and thought to himself, you were planning to adopt me before. I have no idea about this at all. Justin also saw the confusion in Sepples's eyes and smiled softly. My parents are loving and harmonious, but my mother was injured when she gave birth to me. When I said I wanted a brother or sister, at that time, the only way left was adoption. He seemed genuinely sorry. But you know, well, my family has a little money, so there are very few suitable ones who can be adopted by my family, because the conditions are a little harsh. Justin sighed, I don't have anything sincere. My friend, to be honest, that lunch with you was the most reassuring communication I had with my peers. Then he smiled a little sheepishly, but it's much better now. Not many people in Hogwarts know what my family is like. Everyone calls me from a muggle family, this is great. He looked at Sepulus with bright eyes. I didn't expect that I would meet you here, I wasn't sure it was you, and you didn't seem to recognize me, so I never talked to you, greet. My fault, my fault, Serples laughed. He was indeed surprised to meet his previous friends here, but why did you come to Hogwarts? If you were the only child in the family, I wouldn't have asked you to inheriting property or something. Justin spread his hands. I was originally going to go to Eden College, but then I received an owl. After my parents learned about the magical world, they thought it would be good to let me come and play. After all, the company industry and so on, even if I don't understand, I can still pay people who understand to do the work for me. Sepulus blinked and said to himself, Okay, okay, you rich people are doing this, right? So what are you doing here? Justin asked Serples curiously, I see it was Senior Diggory who just brought you in, is he your friend? Serpius waved his hand, Can't we be considered friends? But Senior Cedric takes good care of me. Justin said, Wow, Sepris, you can get along well with anyone. I see you and the young master of the Malfoy family in Slytherin, and that circle over there. We get along very well with each other, you are awesome. They are just selling my guardian's face, Surpris waved his hand, indicating that he didn't want to bring up this issue anymore, it's just the same thing, the upper class, ha. Huh? Justin put his chin back and nodded, indicating that he understood. Just make sure it's you, the boy smiled brightly, saying goodbye to Surpris as before, I'm going to write my thesis on the history of magic later, so I'll say goodbye first. Sepulus nodded. I usually go to the library after class. If you want, you can go to the library to find me. Justin disappeared at the top of the stairs leading to the men's dormitory. When he entered the door, he didn't forget to turn around and wave goodbye to Surpris. And Surprius watched Justin disappear down the stairs before he helped himself again and shrank into the armchair. You're in the library after class. It's quite easy to learn. Cedric's voice sounded above his head, with a smile. Serpolis hurriedly raised his head again, and something cold touched Serpolis' face, the new product in the kitchen, grape smoothie. Ah, Serpolis held the cup. Thank you, thank you. Cedric looked at him. Are you scared? No, Serpolis held the cup. It's just that brother Cedric didn't tell me when he came back. I saw you chatting with someone, so I didn't bother you. Cedric stretched out his hand to rub the top of Sepulus' head. This is a new product in the kitchen. Hufflepuff's lounge is adjacent to the kitchen, and sometimes they keep house elves. When some new products come out, they will be sent to me first for me to try. Sepulus took a sip from the cup, 
Then his eyes lit up. It tastes good. Does it taste good? Cedric held Sepulus's wrist, raised the cup with Sepulus's hand and took a sip. It does taste good. His Adam's apple rolled up and down along with his swallowing movements, and it was so eye-catching and beautiful that it made Surprius look away and make the tips of his ears turn red. Come with me to watch our Quidditch training. Cedric didn't notice anything unusual about Surplus. you haven't had any flying lessons yet, have you? It's the day after tomorrow. Surpris ran through the class schedule in his mind. I haven't taken any flying lessons. It is said that we are afraid that if we are too reckless, our legs will be broken and our arms will be broken after the class, and the hospital wing will not be able to accommodate us. Cedric smiled happily. Let's go and watch my training. I'll introduce you to how to play Quidditch in a moment. If Mrs. Hooch doesn't come to see the stadium, I can also take you to fly around. A circle. Sepulus nodded with bright eyes. Cedric smiled even wider. So Sepples followed Cedric, as obediently as a little tail. Natasha was hurting others in Serpel's arms, saying that Serpels had no future. Sepulus pinched the tip of Natasha's tail. The grounds of Hogwarts are actually quite far away from the main building of the castle, so Serpels has never been there by himself for so long. At most, he only glanced outside when he went to the greenhouse during herbology class, and looked at it from a distance. And Cedric led him along, introducing him to the surrounding things along the way, and repeatedly told Sepulus not to get close to the Whomping Willow, saying that the tree was very dangerous. If it's dangerous, then why do you keep it in the school? Sepulus looked hesitantly at the tree that looked very arrogant. From where Surpris was looking at it, the Whomping Willow was twisting its trunk and branches in a very strange posture. If I had to describe it, it might be like a top that was about to start spinning. Does it really not twist out its roots? Sepulus thought doubtfully. It looks a lot like the kind of thing that can pull out its own roots and run around. It is said that the principal planted it. It is a very temperamental tree. Cedric looked at the Whomping Willow and hesitated slightly. We don't understand why the principal planted this tree. It will really beat the creatures that are close to it, and even shake the snow off the tree trunks when it snows. Surpris looked at the tree and thought to himself that the tree was so bad-tempered. If it could be left to guard the door, wouldn't it be possible for one man to guard the gate and not let anyone open it? But Cedric led him on, and he soon forgot about the Whomping Willow. Chapter 31 When they arrived at the Quidditch field, there were already many people on the field, including Hufflepuff and Gryffindor. Cedric patted Sir Prius on the shoulder and told him that today was a practice match and it would be very exciting, interesting. He was careful, knowing that Serples didn't know much about Quidditch, so he went to get something to explain to Serples, fearing that he wouldn't understand and would be bored. When did you pick up a younger brother? Cedric's teammates laughed at him, but Cedric didn't seem to care and just focused on introducing Serples. There are seven people on each side of the Quidditch team, including three chasers, a keeper, two beaters, and a seeker. Cedric spoke seriously, and Serples listened attentively. When Cedric collected his things and went back to the preparation room to change protective gear, Natasha came out and wrapped her arms around Serples very sternly. On the head, the cheap guy you just liked has a high temperature and his ears are red. Surprius tilted his head, looked around and found that there was no one, he was placed in the Slytherin stand by Cedric. Today was a friendly match between Hufflepuff and Gryffindor, so of course he wouldn't someone from Slytherin came to join in the fun. Really? Serples propped his chin and spoke to Natasha. Really, it's just like those bad people who falsely say you are a good boy, but he is better and doesn't smell weird. Natasha waggled her tail. It's a strange smell. Serples still doesn't know what it smells like, but Natasha can smell it. She can always tell Serples in advance that she smells rotten people and tell Serples to avoid it in advance. Disaster. If you can't avoid it, bite it and poison it to death. Again, Beauty and any card can be a killer, but if played alone, it's a death wish. Fortunately, Sepulus picked up Natasha before the boy's boy opened his mouth, and he never played his cards alone. Brother Cedric is not that kind of person, Serpulus propped up his chin and watched Cedric flying in the sky on a broomstick, I know I'm good looking, but it's the narrow-minded things that make me look disgusted and dislike me. Son. Natasha didn't want to comment on Serpulus's confidence, but just snorted, it's best that he isn't, but even if he is, it's just a matter of one bite. If one bite doesn't work, 
Just take two more bites. What are you afraid of? Upon hearing this, Sepples lifted Natasha off her head and knocked Natasha on the head. Yes, I forgot to remind you. It's not as easy as in Hogwarts as we are outside. You can do whatever you want. You can bite anyone to death, but that's not the case here. I was reading a book two days ago. The people here can detoxify snake venom. Although it is a bit troublesome and the materials used are not ordinary, they can actually detoxify it. Quote. Sir Prius placed his fingers on the top of Natasha's head and swirled them. He can speak parcel tongue and can talk to Natasha more frequently. Natasha has gradually become much smarter, but overall his mind is not very mature. It is just the IQ of a child of a few years old. It feels like that good is good, bad is bad. When Serples went to wake Draco up every day, Natasha felt that Draco was bullying Serples, and she once thought about biting Draco to death. It's fine if you bite him to death directly. What should you do if he doesn't die? Sepulus taught diligently. You taught me to remember to bite someone after I bite them, Natasha replied in confusion, I won't be able to bite someone without killing them. Sepulus' eyesight went dark. Oh, yes, Sepples told Natasha before. After biting someone, aim for the aorta. Because the blood flows quickly, the person will die quickly. After biting someone, you must remember to rebite, otherwise the person will not die. Sometimes I get caught or get something wrong. These are the truths that Serpolis summed up after reading countless storybooks. It's not okay to kill someone without finishing the kill, it's absolutely not okay. How many famous knights, heroes, demon kings, and dragons were counter-killed because they didn't have last hits? Hesepulus is not a fool. Hesepulus remembers to touch up the last bite. Although he has never used his last touch so far, he has taught his snake to touch up the bite. What if you don't bite someone to death? Serpolis avoided the loopholes he taught before. What if you don't bite someone to death and are rescued, or if others see you biting someone? What will you do then? If someone comes to accuse us, we will separate. To be separated, this sentence finally touched upon Natasha's weakness. She stopped wagging her tail and listened more to Surprius's words. I understand. I won't bite anyone casually in the future, Natasha said after careful consideration. If I bite, I'm sure it will kill the person, and there will be no witnesses before I bite again. Surprius touched Natasha's hand and paused. Why doesn't this count? It can only be said that Natasha still has some talent. It's just that this talent is not on the right path. Sepulus nodded, indicating that Natasha was right. He once again set his sights on the sky. The two teams chased each other, leaving after images in the sky, and the howling wind blew by. It turned out that the young man was really nervous. After all, it was a friendly match, and everyone was not in a desperate posture. They were mostly warming up and exercising, laughing and joking, and the Quidditch pitch was very lively. At the end of the first half, Cedric took a water glass from the Hufflepuff rest area and rode a broomstick to Serples. How do you feel? He had just finished exercising. With the steam on his body after exercise and a thin layer of sweat, he sat down next to Serpris and took a sip of water. So handsome, Serples replied sincerely, you must have many fans. Cedric didn't expect Serples to say this to him with a serious face, so he couldn't help but laugh out loud, and drank more saliva, there is no such thing as a fangirl. Serpris blinked and raised his hand to press Cedric's wrist, it's not good to drink water too soon after exercising. Cedric said, oh, and put his hand down obediently. There was silence between the two of them for a while, and a subtle and weird atmosphere began to envelope them. Surpris was trying hard to think of a topic, and so was Cedric. He was already a young man with long hair, his Adam's apple was clearly rolling, and he was pink and white, and he looked good. It took some effort for Sepulus to avert his gaze. When they looked away, they saw two red afterimages coming from the horizon, stopping steadily in front of them. Cedric, is this the smart junior you were talking about? She looks cute, why is she a Slytherin? Oh, God bless and save us from this embarrassing situation. Sepulus was relieved, but then it felt wrong. What does it mean to be a Slytherin? You are a Gryffindor, no, how can you two Gryffindors have the right to criticize me? It's Slytherin, Cedric stood up and introduced to Sepples, the junior I told you about, Sepples. Then he turned to Serples and introduced. These two are the Gryffindor beaters, the twins, George and Fred. 
Sir Prius looked at the red hair of the two smiling twins and pursed his lips, Hello, brothers Weasley. The expressions on the two Weasleys suddenly became very strange. At our house, no one calls us brother. Ron no. Not even Ginny. The two of them sang and harmonized half a sentence each, and they had a tacit understanding. Cedric sighed. You two, don't scare Sepulus. The two Weasleys looked at each other and laughed again, not knowing what made them so happy. But before they left, they smiled at Sepples and said that since Sepples was Cedric's friend, even though he was a Slytherin, he could still put it aside. If he needed help in the future, he could go to Cedric. Go to Yonfindor Tower to find them. Although Sepulus knew that this honor was sold to Cedric, he always felt that it had something to do with the brother he called him. Is there another half in a while? Serples asked softly after watching the Weasley twins fly away. No, it's only half time today, Cedric smiled. The friendly match won't be so strict. Otherwise, there wouldn't be such a concept as half time. Everyone has to stay in the sky and go up when they are tired. Substitute until the snitch is caught by the seeker. Wouldn't it last a long time? Serpolis opened his eyes wide, if the golden snitch is never caught. Yes, Cedric smiled helplessly, sometimes it does last for a long time. I remember that the highest record was that a game lasted for three months, right? The role of the substitutes is not to rest, but to rest. To get someone to take a nap. Serpris didn't know what his expression was like, but looking at Cedric's expression, he felt that his expression should be a little weird because Cedric came to comfort him. But it's still fun. Normally it doesn't last that long, really. He added a little nervously, and then cleared his throat, would you like to play with my broom for a while? Sepulus' eyes hesitated on the broom for a moment, can I? My skills are pretty good, Cedric asked him softly, would you like to give it a try? Just think of it as accumulating experience for flying lessons. There is a certain truth to it. Serples pursed his lips and nodded hesitantly, then, let's try it. Cedric smiled and said yes. Then Cedric helped Serples fly at low altitude on the broomstick. Serples was a little nervous, and the broomstick must have felt this nervousness, so it was shaking slightly, but Cedric's hand it was very stable. His slender hands with clear joints were clasped on Serples's lower back, and he was holding him firmly in circles, getting familiar with the feeling. This is really a magical experience. Seppel's legs were shaking a little when he got off the broomstick, but he smiled happily, the magic is really amazing. Cedric looked at Surprius's smiling face and smiled too, broomsticks can also be used for short trips. Some people specialize in getting flying licenses for broomsticks to make extra money. His eyebrows were as crescent as the crescent moon in the sky, I will run for prefect next year. If I succeed, the scholarship will be enough for me to buy a better broom. Then I may also take you with me in Hogwarts. Turn around. Surpris looked at Cedric's profile, his heart beating like a drum. Okay, okay. He responded softly and looked away. Until Cedric sent him to the door of the Slytherin lounge, his steps were still a little wandering, and he said goodbye to Cedric and went back to the dormitory. He did not go back to the dormitory immediately, but found a sofa in the Slytherin lounge and went in. There weren't many people in the Slytherin lounge at this time, so Sepples took up one of the most comfortable armchairs near the fireplace without any effort, and then he lay down flat in it, unwilling to move. You're not going to fall in love with that Cedric just like that, are you? Natasha hummed in Serpolis's ear, no, then your liking is too hasty. I know, Sepples retorted softly, I'm just a little touched, eh, it can't be considered touched. You know me, no one has ever been nice to me but if he is nice to me, it doesn't matter if I'm moved for a while. Quote. He pursed his lips, but his eyes were clear. I can tell the difference clearly, you don't have to worry about me suffering a disadvantage in this regard. What Serples said was conclusive. Seeing that he knew it, Natasha stopped mentioning it to Serples and changed the subject, but if you don't go back to the dormitory, what are you doing sitting here? I've been either in the dormitory or in the library these days. It's rare to go out for exercise today. I'm going to take a rest and relax. Serple stretched his limbs in the armchair for a while, I decided to make exercise a thing. Things are also on the agenda. Natasha didn't quite understand. Sports. How do you move? I've been reading attack spells recently. I always feel that there is an element of opportunism in it. Serple's yawned, but it can be considered as preparation for going to Durmstrang. 
The fireplaces on both sides are finally China Unicom is on. I'll go there this weekend. He nestled in the armchair again and again. I'm so busy. I haven't found out anything about Riddle yet. He sighed and struggled for a while before finally sitting up straight. Go back and rest early today. He hummed, we will continue in the library tomorrow. Hey, Theodore, when were you here? Separated from circles, Theodore slowly turned over a page of the book in his hand. I've been here all the time, but you didn't notice me. Theodore raised a hand and greeted Circles, I saw that you just threw yourself into the chair. You must be tired, just didn't say hello. Sir Prius touched the tip of his nose and said, oh, yes, it's my problem. My eyesight is bad, I went to see Senior Diggory from Hufflepuff today to watch them play Quidditch. A little tired. He spoke eloquently, but his eyes fell on Theodore's face, looking at Theodore's expression to see if he heard the conversation between him and Natasha, but Theodore's expression was calm, and there was nothing wrong with him. Very good, what do you think of Quidditch? There was nothing wrong with his expression. Sir Prius looked at him for a while before looking away. I think it's quite interesting. Cedric told me that the longest Quidditch game lasted three months. It's hard to imagine what that was like. Sepulus spread his hands and put himself in again, armchair. Why are you here? asked Serples. I often come here, Theodore said calmly, I feel more at ease reading here than in the dormitory, thanks to Slytherin's eye for selecting students, everyone will not make a fuss in the common room. Noisy. Sepulus nodded. He has spent a lot of time tied up with Draco in the past half month, and the time he spends with Theodore has dropped sharply. In other words, he has not talked to Theodore alone for a while, and every time it is simple they met each other, nodded and left. To be honest, his impression of Theodore is actually very good, he is a smart and intelligent man. Aren't you tired? Seeing that Serples had no intention of leaving, Theodore suddenly sat up straight and put the book in his hands on his knees, indicating that he was ready to have a long conversation. What? Sepulus didn't respond. Isn't it tiring to look happy around Draco every day? Theodore seemed to ask sincerely, I can't do it. Serples said, ah, so you're curious about how I did it. Theodore nodded, looking very serious. Serpris grabbed Natasha and touched her hand twice. Maybe it's because I don't think this is a difficult thing. When I was in the orphanage, I had to smile in front of my uncle and aunt, the mother and the director, because I would be better off if they liked me. Sepulus's fingertips were tapping and tapping on Natasha's back, so I didn't feel tired. On the contrary, Draco was already very considerate, and he didn't need me to laugh and flatter him all the time, fine. Theodore pondered for a moment and nodded, that's it. Surpris shrugged, if you can't do it, there's no need to do it. Really, even if you get close to Draco, you won't get anything and it makes you uncomfortable. You might as well live your own life. You he's the young master of the Knot family. You don't have to look at other people's eyes to do things. Theodore raised his eyes and looked at Sepulus for a moment, I can get it. Ah, Sepples was slightly startled, what did you get? My father, Theodore's voice was very soft, he always hopes that I can be on good terms with the Malfoy family and other aristocratic families. Oh, this is something that Sepulus can't comment on. After all, there is no such thing as his father's expectations for Sepples. Well, it's not that it didn't exist at all. Grindelwald's expectations may also be regarded as his father's expectations, but Grindelwald is a man with eyes in the sky, and his expectation for Sepulus is to tell him not to lose Grindel. The surname Woe means face, and don't suffer a loss. Sir Prius looked at Theodore's lowered eyes, pinched the tip of Natasha's tail nervously, then thought about it, and handed Natasha's tail over, yes, do you want to pinch it? Very good. He has really never coaxed anyone. Even if he is usually sweet-tongued and good at talking, he can only say it in a flattering manner, and he can't coax people in a heart-to-heart -heart manner. He can only sacrifice the tip of Natasha's tail. Then Natasha slapped her one tail. You are so arrogant and you want to trick people into taking the tip of my tail. Natasha even pretended to bite her, and then she got into Sepulus's sleeve and stopped moving. Sepul's hand was still holding the gesture of reaching out, and Theodore looked at her for a moment, his eyebrows arched. You and Natasha have a good relationship. Sir Prius laughed and said, yes, she has been with me for many years, and she is like family. The two of them had a tacit understanding and did not continue the previous topic. 
Instead, they spread out the potions book on Theodore's lap, and the two of them chatted together for a long time. Although I know this is a bit redundant, when he finally said goodbye at the door of the dormitory, Surpris hesitated for a long time, but still pulled Theodore's sleeve, I know that children from noble families have their own characteristics. You have no choice but to live as you please, but, Theodore, this is your own life. Surprius said, feeling a little embarrassed, scratching his hair, and quickly entered the dormitory through the gate of opening. He didn't know that after he entered the room, Theodore paused at the door for a long time before raising his hand and returning to the dormitory. The course was still going on, and the two days passed like water. The flying lesson was put on the schedule in just a blink of an eye. The enthusiasm in everyone's eyes gradually became more and more intense as the time approached. In the morning, the owl delivered letters and packages. Draco's family loved him very much. Every time the owl delivered something, there would be something from his family. Sometimes there were too many things, and Draco would pick and choose. Share it with friends around you. At this time, there is a suspicion of competition for favor. The person who has the closest relationship with Draco will get the most and the best points. It is like Blaze or Sepulus who usually get the most, followed by the Parkinson family. The young lady, Daphne again, then Theodore, and finally Gook Laboon, the two who acted almost as decorations. Speaking of the Parkinson's lady, her name is Pansy. She is usually very quiet and doesn't talk much. Serple sometimes feels that compared to her and Daphne, Daphne should be closer to Draco, but Draco is closer to Pansy. Some. Later, Blaze took the initiative to explain, saying that marriage was the norm among aristocratic families, and Pansy was quite outstanding among her peers, so she was most likely to become Mrs. Malfoy in the end. The package Draco handed to Pansy this morning was also carefully packed in advance at a glance. Everyone was thinking about the flying class, so the daytime class passed by in the blink of an eye, and it did not restrain everyone's thoughts. At 3.30 that afternoon, everyone just finished the charms class, and they were all focused on rushing to the venue for the flying class. Which house are we with? Daphne was out of temper and refused to walk on the stone steps in a disciplined manner. She insisted on dragging Pansy along to walk on the green grass. Fortunately, Hogwarts was full of greenery, and the grass was the vitality of the flower is stronger than that of the students, and it is not afraid of being stepped on half-stepped like this. With Gryffindor, Blaze, who was always the one with the best information, asked Daphne. He immediately picked up the topic, stood beside Daphne with brisk steps, and even smiled tenderly. Brace has been thinking about Daphne for more than a day or two, Draco suddenly spoke next to Serples, they should be childhood sweethearts. Sepples turned his head to look at him, then don't you and Pansy deserve to be childhood sweethearts? But Draco just smiled. Everyone wants to be the wife of the Malfoy family, but no one can say who she will be in the end. Serples was slightly startled and thought to himself, wow, that's not what Sabreth and I said. What he said was conclusive and he just came close to telling me that Pansy will change her name to Pansy Malfoy in the future. And now you tell me it's not necessarily true. Theodore followed suitably and stood on the other side of Serples. The Greengrass family also has a younger daughter, who is said to have a well-born appearance, and is also interested in the position of Mrs. Malfoy. Quote. Draco glanced at Theodore coolly. But Theodore paid no attention. Whatever, Draco looked away, suddenly a little irritable, it's just our family marrying each other, it's so boring. Because of this episode, Draco didn't look good at the beginning of class, especially when their professor, a hawk like Ms. Hooch with short gray hair and sharp yellow eyes, repeatedly corrected Draco on holding the flying sky. When he stood in the broom posture, Draco's expression was so bad that he couldn't even look at it. At that time, Everyone in Slytherin knew that as long as they didn't take the initiative to provoke or get into Draco's bad luck, nothing would happen. Although Draco was angry and arrogant, he wasn't the kind of person who would do anything when he was angry. An angry dandy. But although these Slytherins did not provoke Draco, Harry Potter met Draco's anger. Draco himself pointed out that Harry Potter didn't give him any face in the Great Hall before the sorting, and Harry Potter didn't have a good look on him. Now. Harry Potter came out to confront him again when he was angry. Going against him directly ignited Draco's anger. In the beginning, it was not Harry or Draco's fault. 
It started when everyone tried to get on a broomstick for the first time, and Gryffindor's Neville Longbottom suddenly lost control of his broom, causing him to fall into the sky. He fell from a high altitude while he was in the air and broke his wrist. There was an accident in the middle of the class, and Ms. Huochi's face didn't look good. She only had time to tell the students to put their broomsticks back to their original places, otherwise she would definitely make them look good when she came back, so she hurriedly took them away following Longbottom back to the castle. Longbottom had a tear streak on his face, and he limped back while being supported by Ms. Hooch, who put an arm around him. Draco looked at their backs and sneered, then turned to ask Blaze beside him, have you seen what he looks like, that stupid big guy? Blaze smiled in agreement, shut up, Malfoy, a Gryffindor girl with long braids snapped. Protect Longbottom, Pansy Parkinson spoke, this was almost the first time that Serples heard her speak loudly. She was usually quiet and gentle, but when she opened her mouth, she could hear her. He and Draco obviously have the same language system, gentle, but arrogant and mean, I never thought you would like a chubby little tear bag, Pottle. The Gryffindor girl's face turned red. Look, Draco bent down and picked something up from the ground, what did he leave behind? He raised his hand, and it was a glass ball with white smoke inside. That's a memory ball, Theodore whispered to Serples next to him. If you forget something, the smoke inside will turn red when you pick up the memory ball. Obviously, Draco, who picked up the memory ball now, has forgotten nothing. The white smoke in the memory ball is floating and shining in the sun. Bring it here, Malfoy. Harry said. Draco frowned and looked at him, and sneered, Why should I listen to you, Potter? His voice was drawn out, and each word was pronounced slowly, full of vitriol. You don't really think of yourself as someone, do you? Draco sneered, I'm going to put this memory ball somewhere and let Longbottom pick it up by himself, do you think I put him there? How about on a tree? Then he jumped on his broomstick. Ah, don't we care? Sepulus took another step closer to Theodore's position, isn't it not good to just watch the fun like this? It's okay, it's unnecessary for us to intervene now, Theodore looked very calm, Draco can just make a fuss on his own for a while. We all have experience, and he also has a sense of proportion. Sir Prius turned his head around and found that neither Brace nor Pansy seemed to care at all, and they even started chatting with the people around them. Seppel said to himself, wow, you guys have such a solid friendship, and then he looked away. The final result of this incident was that Draco landed successfully, but Harry landed half a beat slower because he went to grab the memory ball thrown by Draco, and was caught and taken away by Professor McGonagall. Draco was satisfied with this. He believed that Harry would be punished well, whether it was confinement or something else, Professor McGonagall always made a distinction between public and private matters, and Draco didn't think she would be punished because Harry was her student. Just keep an open mind. His good mood lasted until dinner when he saw Harry still having dinner at the Gryffindor table laughing and noisily with the people around him. What's going on? Draco's face darkened again, why is he here? No one could answer him. Draco stood up with a cry, and then he pulled up Sepples who was sitting next to him with half a cinnamon roll in his mouth. Let's go take a look. Sir Prius's eyes widened, and he looked hard at Theodore, wondering what was going on. Didn't he say that no harm comes to outsiders? So what's going on with him dragging me along now? Theodore lightly shrugged at him, indicating that he didn't know what Draco was smoking. When Serple stood in front of the Gryffindor table with a roll in his mouth, he had already begun to wonder if it would be better to let Natasha bite him lightly and pretend to be stunned. Anyway, I just want to die. Especially when Harry stood up excitedly to greet him when he saw him, but visibly wrinkled his face when he saw Draco beside Serpolis, this feeling of wanting to die reached a point where peak. Why are you here, Malfoy? Harry's voice was filled with disgust and disgust. Come to see you, Potter, Draco raised his chin, are you eating your last meal? When are you going back to the muggle world? I'm sorry to disappoint you. Harry choked back mercilessly, I can't do what you want, I'm staying at Hogwarts well, why should I go back? Draco's expression turned colder. Oh, since you are so confident, how about a wizard duel tonight? Draco's eyes were cold, how about using only wands and no contact? Draco said this suddenly, and Harry was a little stunned for a moment, but Draco took advantage of the victory and sneered, what, you haven't heard of duels between wizards? 
Of course he has heard of it. Ron Weasley, who was behind Harry, stood in front of Harry. I am his assistant. Who is your assistant? Draco frowned slightly, then snorted. Sepris is my assistant. Serpolis, I haven't finished the roll in my mouth yet. Have you ever considered my feelings? Where? Ron Weasley asked. How about today, at midnight? Let's meet in the trophy showroom, where the door is never locked. Draco thought coldly for a moment, and then gave the location. Ron nodded seriously, and Draco snorted coldly, pulling Sepulus away. Serpulus, you caught me here and you caught me away again, and I didn't even finish the bread in my mouth. Do I don't want to lose face? But maybe this face is not worth it. After all, he was dragged back by Draco again. After returning to the Slytherin table, Theodore took pity on Serpils and handed him pumpkin juice to let him go. Isn't it a bit hasty? Sepulus finally wiped off the bread in his mouth, feeling a little sad, isn't he just allowed to go out for a wizard duel casually? A wizard's duel is actually a very serious matter. Generally speaking, it can be said to be a duel with honor on the line. It is very serious and is a quite formal agreement. As for the assistant, after the duel wizard dies, the assistant will take over. But of course, when the first year wizards arranged a duel, it was just a small fight. They didn't learn many spells, and at most they just threw a few prank-like spells at each other. It's better to hit someone with your fists, isn't it? Throw the wand and knock the person down while the other person is stunned, and that's it. But Sepples looked Draco up and down for a moment, feeling that Draco probably couldn't do this. Draco seems like the kind of squeaky clean guy, so let him hit someone with his fists. There is difficulty, but I, Serpolis, don't hit anyone either. Serpils really felt that Draco's direct appointment to a duel was very thoughtless. I'm not really going, Draco snorted, I'm going to tell Filch that there are students who stay up late at night and hang out in the prize room. Filch is the administrator of Hogwarts. He is a very fierce guy. It seems that all his fun is to find out the students' mistakes and then put them in solitary confinement. He also has a cat named Mrs. Norris. The cat is as smart as a human being. Whenever she discovers that a student has violated discipline, she will immediately summon Filch out of nowhere, and then ask Filch to arrest the students and put them in solitary confinement. He looked around at Sepples. You're not going to accept the appointment, are you, Sepples? Sepulus smiled softly. You made an appointment with a wizard for a duel, and you said that I would be your assistant. Draco frowned. So what? You don't have to care, but I can't. Sir Prius took Theodore's stretched out hand with his backhand and pressed it on his leg to signal him to stop talking. My surname is Grindelwald. When I left Austria, my father's only request is that I cannot bring shame to this family name. Draco frowned, and several people on the long table were silent. It doesn't matter if you think this is a joke, Sir Prius shrugged, quite indifferent, but I think you know my father. He is very enthusiastic about duels. If he knew that I accepted the duel, if I miss the date again, he will break my legs. He smiled broadly and looked directly at Draco. You can still complain to Filch, but I will go. If they ask, I will probably say that you are not feeling well. Draco snorted coldly. Blaze came out to smooth things over. Mr. Grindelwald is indeed. Everyone knows that he was naughty when he was a boy, looking for people to fight and cause trouble everywhere, but every duel also gave him a name. Sepulus, it's normal for you to fancy a duel. Ha 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 ha. Draco snorted again. Then go, it's not a big deal, they can't beat me even in a duel. As mentioned before, Draco is not a playboy who only knows how to show off his temper. He initially regarded this matter as a piece of fun, and he could severely trick Harry and the others into telling the truth, but his friends took it seriously. Yes, he already feels that Serpils is his friend. But since his friend took it seriously, he had no reason to show off his face. After all, the wizard's duel did sound important. If Grindelwald knew that Serpils escaped the duel, he would break his legs. Mr. Malfoy if you knew Draco took duels for fun, you would be a little unhappy. But even though he agreed, he still had to be tough, I'm going all because of you. Otherwise, I will definitely tell Filch and severely deduct points from Gryffindor. Sir Prius smiled and poured Draco a glass of apple juice. At half past eleven, they quietly came out of their dormitory on time. Here you go, Serpolis spread his hand and handed Draco a small glass bottle with a silvery liquid inside. Keep it in your pocket. 
Draco raised his eyebrows. What is this? The invisibility potion, Serpolis replied. I took it, but the effect may not be very good. It may only be invisible for three minutes. Did you survive it? Draco held up the bottle and stared. Invisibility potion as a fifth grade course. Slytherin students have a good habit of preparing their homework in advance, and even ask tutors for tutoring in advance. However, Draco stared at the small glass bottle and then at Seppel's, fifth grade. That was fifth grade. Class. Oh, Professor Snape gave me a list and asked me to try it myself. Surpris tightened his sleeves, if you have any questions, go to him and ask him. He looked at the small bottle he gave to Draco, with unconcealable regret in his tone, I can never purify the venom of the Acromantula. Draco's eyes twitched slightly, is this why you keep buying things recently? Did you buy all the potion ingredients? It's not about the materials. Just get them from Professor Snape's cabinet, Serpolis explained. I mainly bought the equipment, such as the venom of the Acromantula. Not only does it cost a lot of bottles, but it also costs a lot of gloves, it's also very wasteful. Draco's eyes twitched even more. Okay, okay. He put the small bottle of potion into his pocket and walked out of the Slytherin lounge with Serpolis. Slytherin has always been a relatively well-behaved house. It's a bit inaccurate to say that, because Slytherin students are actually quite rebellious at heart, but they all judge the situation quite well. In their eyes, breaking the curfew at night in Hogwarts wandering around is quite dangerous, quite boring and not cost-effective. Therefore, Filch usually does not come to patrol the Slytherin cellars. He pays more attention to the Ravenclaws who have some whimsical ideas and are quite rebellious and don't care much about gains and losses. Gryffindor. So Sepples and Draco walked to the prize display room without any obstruction, and it could even be said that it was smooth sailing, even the people in the portraits on the road fell asleep, and no one noticed them. When they arrived at the showroom, they went through the door. The crystal glass cabinet displaying the awards shone in the moonlight, and the trophies, shields, medals and statues shone with gold and silver. It's quite beautiful here when the moonlight shines on it. Draco muttered, and Sepulus also used the moonlight to look at the medals around him. They were all names of unknown people, and he passed them with a glance, but suddenly, his eyes paused. That's a golden medal. June 1942, Tom Marvolo Riddle, Award for Special Contributions to the School. Sepples even wiped his eyes for this, repeatedly confirming that he had not seen it wrong. Tom Marvolo Riddle. This is the full spelling of Tom, and it is indeed the name he wrote on the cover of his diary. The names match and the year is about the same. This should be a reward for the Tom in his house. Surpris couldn't help but get closer, wanting to look at the medal carefully, but as soon as he got closer, he discovered something was wrong. The dust marks under this medal are wrong, and the size of the metal base does not match the dust marks. The traces are clear. This metal was just moved over. Sepples took a few steps back slightly, his heart tightening. He once again looked at the place where the metal was placed. In the middle of the third row straight ahead from the door, it was a very eye-catching location. Even the moonlight hit it, and the lighting was the best. Yes, as long as someone comes in and looks at it curiously, they will definitely come over and take a look. Sure enough, just as Sepulus stepped back and watched, Draco also came over. He also stopped in front of the medal under the moonlight, special contribution award to the school. What kind of award is this? Why have I never heard of it? Pass. Sepulus felt a chill in his heart. Who moved the medal? Who was it intended to show? His heart was in turmoil, and he was in a state of confusion for a moment. At this time, there was movement at the door, and Draco immediately took Sepulus's wrist and found a place to squat down. There was a rattling sound at the door for a while, and Harry filed in, followed by Ron. There were actually people behind him, not to mention Hermione Granger, but also Neville Long, who had broken his wrist. Barden. Both Sepulus and Draco were a little dumbfounded. They looked at each other and came out of hiding, their expressions a little complicated. You, Draco hesitated, not knowing what to say. Sepulus hesitated for a moment, then answered Draco's words, You are here to duel, why are you dragging your family with you? Harry looked a little embarrassed. He opened his mouth as if he wanted to say something, but nothing came out several times. In the end, he could only look at Sepulus and touch the tip of his nose. Draco was quite dissatisfied with this. 
He turned slightly sideways and stood in front of Serples, blocking Harry and Serples from looking at each other. We are here to duel, Draco's voice was filled with dissatisfaction, why are you staring at my people? Why is Sepulus yours? Harry's voice became even more dissatisfied, I knew him earlier than you, right? The two of them disliked each other very much, and Serpolis always felt that they might still want to fight. He took a step forward to try to dissuade him. At this time, there was a rustling sound from the next room. Sniff around, darling, it was Filch's voice. We didn't have the blindfold when we just walked down that corridor. Blindfold. The six people present were stunned for a moment, and then they saw Hermione Granger panicking and starting to look through her pockets, she and Neville Longbottom were both wearing pajamas. My, Hermione Granger said nervously, as if she was about to cry, my blindfold, which was originally in my pocket, fell out. Wow, that's true. Sepples quickly grabbed Draco and prepared to run away from the back door, if you didn't break the appointment, you didn't lose face. You can make an appointment for a duel later, but if you are caught by Filch and imprisoned before it starts, it will be a shame. Bar. It's the truth. Harry and the four of them followed closely and started to move towards the back door in the direction of Suprius and Draco. When Neville Longbottom turned the corner for the last time, Filch entered the trophy room with his lady Norris. They evacuated in an orderly manner, and their speed was not slow. Mrs. Norris was not put down from Filch's arms, so they had plenty of time to slip away, and Sepples and Draco still had their share. Half-assed invisibility potion. Sepples was in pretty good condition. He had done something like sneaking out in the middle of the night before when he was in the orphanage. However, most of that time was to go to the kitchen to find food, and a small part of it was to run to the attic there are many books in the attic of the orphanage, but generally no one goes up there. It is a shabby place with only dust and rats. So Serples was not very nervous. He walked in front, walking briskly, holding Draco's wrist. Everything was going smoothly originally, and they had put a considerable distance away from Filch. As long as they walked through this long corridor, they could part ways at the corner, one group going up and the other going down. But Longbottom was too scared. His steps were chaotic, and he accidentally stepped on Ron in front of him. He let out a scream, then hugged Ron's waist, and fell onto a set of armor with him. Suddenly, there was a clang and a crash, and the sound was enough to wake up the entire castle. Run, Serples couldn't care less at this moment. He pulled Draco and ran away quickly, not daring to look back to see if Filch was following. He took Draco with him, Draco was a little staggered by his pull, but he quickly stopped caring. They quickly distanced themselves from Harry and the others behind them. Do you remember the way? Draco asked Serples in a low voice. Remember, Sepulus breathed softly, there are two armors in the hall when you turn around. We are hiding behind the armors. We are going to drink the medicine and hide quickly. The situation was urgent, but they didn't care much. They took advantage of this time difference to hide behind their armors, listening to Harry and the others running straight past the entrance hall, and listening to Filch chasing the movement in front of them and gradually walking away. Only then did they drink the half-baked invisibility potion, and then got out from behind the armor. Where is this? Draco had obviously never been here before. He looked at the armor he had just hidden behind him, and at the unfamiliar doorways in front and behind him. Under the West Tower, Sepulus replied, knowing what Draco wanted to ask, so he answered in advance, I was idle before, thinking that the astronomy class was in the East Tower, and I was curious about what the West Tower was for. Yes. I just came here and took a walk. What's the West Tower for? Draco asked. Divination class, Sepulus made a face, and then realized later that they had just finished drinking the potion and Draco couldn't see his expression, professor of divination class, ah, maybe that's not a good thing to say, but seriously, it's really boring. Draco nodded slightly, indicating that he understood. Sir Prius led the way, and they returned to Slytherin's lounge under the moonlight at night, and the journey was smooth. The two of them walked through the stone corridor and entered the lounge one after another, and then met Daphne's smiling and excited face, how is it? Her voice was lowered, but it was also very cheerful, and her beautiful eyes turned around on Serples and Draco. Did you give Potter and the others a hard lesson? On the sofa behind her, Blaze, Theodore, and Pansy were also prominently there. Blaze even raised his hand to greet Serples and Draco who had just entered the door. Why are you here? 
Draco was stunned for a moment. Because we are all curious, Daphne said with a smile as she sat down on Draco. Seriously, Draco, this is the most unconventional thing we have done since we were grown up, everyone. All curious. Draco curled his lips. When it comes to deviants, you can't be counted among us. You are more deviant than us. This refers to Daphne's dissatisfaction with the arrangement of being a noble daughter in her family. Daphne snorted. You're such a letdown. But she didn't really have any objections to Draco. She just snorted and then turned her eyes to Sir Prius. How is it? No fight. Sepulus met Daphne's gaze. Filch came over just as we all arrived, and we turned around and ran over. Daphne was a little dumbfounded. So you just had a life and death battle with Filch in the castle. Sepulus thought for a moment. That's fair to say. That's pretty cool. Daphne said a little disappointed, but quickly cheered up. I haven't run out during curfew time yet, but I can try it later. She said eagerly, and Sepulus looked over Daphne's shoulder at Blaze, who just looked at Daphne's back and smiled. Quite doting on you. Sir Prius looked away. But how did Filch find you so quickly? Theodore asked a question. It's not like those Gryffindor idiots, Draco snorted. There were four of them, bringing their families with them. One of them, Granger, came out wearing this pajamas and dropped his blindfold in the corridor. It's in, I asked Filch to pick it up and touch it all the way. How many of them went there? Blaze was a little unbelievable, isn't it a wizard duel? They used to fight in groups. Maybe they won't be in this lineup for group fights, Serpolis said a little hesitantly, Granger aside, Longbottom just broke his wrist today, what can he do? Longbottom is here too. Blaze clicked his tongue, they are really making a joke. Yes, Draco yawned, it's too late. Go to sleep. We all have classes tomorrow. If you have any questions, we'll ask you tomorrow. After he finally made the final decision, everyone stopped making noise and went back to their dormitories to rest. Surpris bid farewell to the people around him and returned to the dormitory, but did not lie down. Instead, he opened the diary and tapped on the cover page, Tom. Have you slept? Tom didn't sleep. Maybe ghosts don't need to sleep very much. Anyway, Surpris just knocked, and Tom came out with the same poker face, what's wrong? My trip out at night is not in vain. Surpris had something on his mind, but he was not sleepy, so he told Tom about the evening's events in detail. He saw it in the trophy display room. That medal, and the gray mark that doesn't match the number. Tom listened, lowered his eyes and thought, and when he raised his head, his eyes became clearer. Do you think it is possible that the person who moved the medal deliberately let you know that the medal was newly moved? Since the man wanted to move the medal, he must have known that Serples was going to the prize showroom, so he moved the medal so that Serples could see it better. But it was only decided during dinner that night that Serples was going to the prize showroom. It was decided that night and he left at midnight. If that person knew about it and acted so quickly, he must have been there long ago. He became interested in Serpolis's actions, and maybe even spied on him secretly. So the dust marks were not wiped away, but Sepulus found out that someone was watching him secretly. This makes sense, Sepulus frowned. But, who is it? He thought silently, was there anything worthy of concern about him, why would he spend so much time staring at him, and even send him the news about Tom he was looking for at a certain location? I don't know who you have crossed paths with in Hogwarts, Tom said, speaking very slowly, but let me guess, it's just Dumbledore or Quirrell. Serples paused, knowing that Tom was right, and thought for a moment with his eyes lowered. Maybe I can take the initiative. Serpris raised his eyes to discuss with Tom, what do you think of me taking the initiative to ask Quirrell who Tom Riddle is? Tom paused. Go to Quirrell first. I feel like Quirrell should have asked better. Doesn't he look like that? Serpris looked for an adjective hesitantly. He doesn't look that smart. Tom's expression was a little weird. This, he is still your professor after all, so that's it, doesn't it matter? Serpris thought about Quirrell's defense against the dark arts class, and then looked at Tom. To be honest, when I first saw Quirrell, I really had serious doubts about the strength of the teaching staff at Hogwarts, but apart from that he and other professors are quite reliable, but he is probably an exception and unreliable. After a pause, Serpolis added, I heard them say before that it might be the Dark Lord who cursed the position of Professor of Defense against Dark Arts because he wanted to stay in school to teach this class. Professor, but was blocked. After hearing this, 
Tom fell into a certain degree of silence, but his eyes flickered. Sepulus looked at him and knew that he was thinking of something again. He reached out and knocked on the table. What did you think of? I'm not sure, but I think, Tom said with a slight hesitation, have you ever thought about staying in school after graduation? Staying in school to teach. Surpris was stunned for a moment. I have thought about it. I want to stay in school and work after graduation. This is a super job, right? It includes food and accommodation, and plenty of holidays. Although the salary is not generous, but I probably won't live purely on salary. Halfway through his words, he paused. He looked at Tom in front of him, raised his finger tremblingly and pointed at Tom, and then tremblingly pointed back at himself. Tom nodded. The expression on Sepulus's face suddenly became weird and powerful. Yes, I haven't thought about it in this direction, but it's not no, and it's not impossible. Surprius murmured for a long time. He had indeed never thought about this, but what Tom just said did give Sepulus a new way of thinking. He and Tom have similar thoughts. Since he has thought about staying in school to teach, it means that Tom must also have thought about leaving a curse on this position if he does not get the position. Sepples asked himself seriously and found that he really couldn't do it. After all, I came from a place like an orphanage, and this orphanage is not a very kind place. It is normal to be a little sick. It has been confirmed that Tom Riddle must have studied at Hogwarts, but why did Serple search everywhere but find no trace of him? There is no trace of him in the alumni list. But he should not be an ordinary, unknown student, as evidenced by the Academy Special Contribution Award medal found today. He should have been very good back then and done some great things, but why can't there be any trace of him? He may have been erased. But why erase him? What did he do to be erased? Originally, he had no ideas. After all, his understanding of the magical world was only limited to what was in books, and his ideas did not broaden much. He has never focused his thoughts on the guy known as, you know who, he who must not be named, Dark Lord, and, Voldemort. But now that he thought about it, he really didn't know the true name of the Dark Lord whom he even somewhat yearned for. Can't really call him Tom Riddle. Surpris pressed his temples. I'll go to the library to look through it tomorrow. Besides, I'm going to Durmstrang on the weekend. Maybe I can find some clues in Durmstrang, right? Quote. He looked at Tom in front of him with complicated emotions, and said wow, if this was true, then he was talking to his idol in his youth. This is a bit strange. Tom Riddle himself was much calmer. I'm just raising a possibility, but it may not be accurate. You don't have to have such high hopes. Then he raised his hand and sent Sepulus to bed and quickly went to sleep. Sepples rolled into bed obediently. The next day, Serples had quite a few dark circles under his eyes. After the day's class, he turned around and rushed to the library, and then read books everywhere in the library. He focused on looking for information and flipped through the entire library area. As he was flipping through the pages, he saw a figure with twitching shoulders and sobbing softly in a place where the family spells section was hung. Seppel stood in front of the bookshelf, wondering why the figure from behind looked so familiar. After looking at it intently for a while, he finally came to his senses, Granger. The girl whose name was Red was stunned for a moment. She raised her hand to wipe her face in panic, then turned her head and looked at Surprius, Grindelwald. Her eyes were red and she looked like she had been crying. Serples paused, touched his pocket, and handed over a pack of tissues, are you okay? Hermione Granger took the packet of paper hesitantly, and smiled forcefully, no, why are you here? I'm here to read a book and look for information, Serpolis gave a general idea, why are you here? Granger's eyes wandered for a moment. I don't want to say it. Well, Sepples nodded in agreement without asking any more questions, then you can rest for a while, I'll leave first. He left so simply, but it made Hermione a little confused. She muttered for a moment, and then called out to Sepples. When you were in the orphanage, did you meet any particularly annoying people? Surprius turned back, leaned against the bookshelf, and raised an eyebrow. Every place has people worth hating, and the orphanage cannot be regarded as a distinctive place. Granger's face paled slightly. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Surprius waved his hand. I know, but, Miss Granger, since you know how to ask me, then maybe you should also listen to other people's voices, why are those who are not liked by others not liked by others? 
like. Ranger's face was still pale, but she hesitated, nodded, and said thank you in a low voice, thank you. Surprius nodded to her again, then turned and left. This was an ordinary little episode. Serples quickly forgot about it, because he dressed like a dumpling the next day and walked directly to the fireplace in the dormitory. A student dormitory in Durmstrang. What greeted him was a tall boy, wearing a red uniform, with brown hair, deep and overly eyebrows, and deep dark green eyes that reminded Sepulus of the black man under the Hogwarts castle for a moment. Lake. Bulwer Gar Wolf. He stretched out his hand to support Sir Prius, who had just walked out of the fireplace and was slightly dizzy. The voice is also quite nice, with a bit of a strange accent in English. Sepris Grindelwald. Sepris held his arm to steady himself. Well, the young man nodded, I'll take you to get familiar with it in school first. Are you taking me? Sepples was surprised. I'm sorry, but don't I need to see the principal or report to you? Wolf looked at Sepples and shook his head. Principal Karkaroff is just a decoration, you don't need to pay much attention to him. Sepples was startled again and thought to himself that he might have heard wrongly and directly called his principal a mere decoration. Is this really okay? But Wolf apparently sees no problem with that. He didn't seem to be a talkative person, but rather an activist who took a little too much action. He directly took off Serpra's coat, and when Sepras was still confused, he only took off his coat. He was left with only a shirt and a pair of pants, and he was almost bitten by Natasha. This, my pet, is also my family, Natasha. Serpolis felt that his mind was not turning very well for a moment, as this, is this a welcome ceremony? Is Durmstrang such a simple people? No way. Wolf paused, then took a set of clothes from the sofa on one side and handed them to Serpils. He said nothing. Confused and a little trembling, Surprius took the clothes and saw that the lining of the suit was the same as Wolf's. This could be Durmstrang's school uniform. Sepulus's mind turned slightly. No, are the people of Durmstrang really so simple? What's wrong with jumping right in? If I were a girl, would you do it directly? If a girl doesn't give you a slap, that girl is cowardly. Sepulus saw that Wolf in front of him had no intention of turning around or leaving. He resignedly calmed down the somewhat irritable Natasha, and then changed his clothes under Wolf's eyes. When he picked up the coat, which could not be identified as animal skin and had a red lining, Wolf held his hand, it's not that cold indoors. Surprius nodded stiffly and held the coat in his hands. Natasha hissed at Wolf for a moment, then got into Surprius' collar. Durmstrang also has a castle-like Hogwarts school of witchcraft and wizardry, but their castle is not as big as Hogwarts' castle. It only has four floors, so there are not many students. Wolf and Sepples explained that it was because Durmstrang only recruited purebloods. Oh, a large number of them were screened out invisibly, right? Sepulus understood. Durmstrang has considerable grounds and stunning views. The large tracts of Nordic forest are covered with frost and snow, bringing with them a biting chill. They are quite beautiful. Behind the castle there is a mountain lake where some dark, ghostly ships dock. Students also dive here in the summer. Wolf looked at the lake, and in the winter too. Sepulus breathed a sigh of relief and watched the water vapor at the exit turn into small crystal frosts. Okay, okay, it is indeed a school famous for physical skills. If you ask Sepulus to jump in for a swim now, Sepples might just turn over on his belly and die in front of you. Wolf didn't say much, but he took Sepulus around the entire Durmstrang, and stopped in the dual practice room, personally went on stage, and picked up an unlucky guy from the ground. Sun gave Sepulus a dual demonstration. About 10 minutes, maybe less than 10 minutes, Sepulus looked at the opponent who flew out with blood on his face and was randomly caught by Wolf, and was dumbfounded. He can reach out and beat you to death, Natasha snorted in Serpulus's ear, you were really in a good place. Wolf walked back to Serpulus at the end, not even breathing. You also need to train, Wolf's voice sounded above Sepulus's head, which was no less than a thunderbolt for Sepulus. When you come every week, I will guide you. When Surpris returned to Hogwarts, he felt like his whole body was broken. That guy from the Wolf family was really ruthless. Whether it was opening his back or something else, he really went to death to loosen Sepples's bones. He pressed Sepples so hard that he almost died. But Sepulus gritted his teeth and endured. After all, he also knew that Wolf was right, he had no foundation, and if he wanted to excel, he would have to work hard. 
However, Wolf didn't just go crazy. He gave Sepples a lot of herbal bags to soak in, and he also made an exercise plan for Sepples. Sepples followed it and carried it out for the first time. God, and then I discovered that this guy had very good control over the volume. It's the kind of thing that Sepples could finish if he worked hard, but it wouldn't be possible if he didn't work hard. Sepulus, I can't stand it. But after all, I have no time to spare for this, and the frequency of going to the library has been greatly reduced. I am running circles and doing exercises every day. Then I went to Durmstrang the next week. After being pressed to the ground and rubbed by Wolf for a long time, Wolf nodded, simply cleaned sepals and threw it into the bath, and threw in a pack of herbs. There was not a bathtub in Durmstrang's dormitory, but a rather small one. You're not slacking off. In the steaming water in the bathroom, Wolf spoke quietly. I don't know if it was Sepulus's illusion, but he seemed to hear a sense of relief in Wolf's voice. But Serples may not have the energy to care whether Wolf is happy or not now. He came over and wore a pair of underwear. Although he was very grateful to Wolf for not stripping him completely, what should he do with the underwear? Perhaps because Sepples's eyes were too sad, Wolf also took off his clothes and entered the bath. Sepulus' eyes fell on his exposed and thin waist, but then his eyes were attracted by the layered injuries on Wolf's back. There are also injuries on his inner thighs. If the nuns at the orphanage are angry, spanking can be a public punishment, but sometimes when they vent their anger privately, they will twist the child's thighs. That would hurt the child enough, but not be discovered. But the wound on Wolf's back was obviously not pinched out, it seemed to have been pulled out by a whip. Sepples raised his hand stiffly, and then quietly took it back without asking. Wolf followed Sepples' gaze and understood clearly, my father left it. The Wolf family is considered a new aristocracy in Germany. They come to the stage with the same Wolf nature as their last name. The patriarch is the Alpha Wolf, and he will work hard to hone his chosen successor and then train him. The strongest, the next wolf who can withstand the wind and snow for the wolves. Bulwer is the eldest son, and his burden is particularly heavy. Sir Prius nodded, indicating that he understood. He didn't ask if it hurt or send him any care. He knew that Wolf probably didn't need it very much. Even if he did, he probably didn't need someone he had only met a few times, own comfort. But the next time he came, he brought candy. When Draco gave them to him, he selected the most delicious ones, then wrote an order to buy them, and finally put them on Wolf's bedside table. Wolf's room is very simple, as clean as a model house. There are no traces of his own life. The box of candy looks even more awkward, but at least it can be seen by Wolf at a glance. Life has been hard, so there should be something to sweeten it. Time is too thin and the gaps between my fingers are too wide. I can't catch its passage, so I can only run forward staggeringly at his speed. Halloween soon came, and Wolf gave Serples a day off, telling him to just have fun at Hogwarts on Halloween. You've been really busy lately, Draco looked at Serples who had lost a lot of weight recently, and condescended to serve Serples a Halloween limited lamb chop. You've been very busy lately. Haven't you grown taller? Maybe. Sepulus also served himself a ghost-shaped custard, I have indeed exercised a little harder recently, and it is reasonable for me to grow taller. Is Durmstrang really so strict? Daphne was the most talkative among the group. She came over curiously and asked, I saw that when you were changing your robe in the herbology class that day, you had bruises all over your back, then Bianer won't hit students, right? Theoretically, there is no fighting, Serpris smiled, but there is a dueling club over there, and students fight each other, I could only get beaten at first, but now I can do more or less. It was me who beat them. Hogwarts takes on a new look for Halloween, with a thousand fondant bats flying between the walls and ceiling, and a thousand low dark clouds made of fondant hovering over the dining table, which you can reach out to pick them up with a fork and eat them. The flames in the pumpkin's belly seem to be dancing, but the ghosts are not here. It is said that they have their own way of celebrating Halloween. Dumbledore is willing to spend money here, Blaze forked off a dark cloud and ate it. This is the craftsmanship of the cake shop in Diagon Alley. Their aristocratic young master is very talkative and can taste good food. If it were surplus, he could only take a bite and then sincerely praise how delicious it is. He was showing off an apple pie fiercely. He was exercising recently. The list Bulwer gave him told him to eat as nutritious and healthy as possible.
It had been a long time since he had eaten sweets happily and wantonly. But he did notice that Bulwer would eat the candy he brought over. I brought you all the food, but when you came to my place, you restricted me from eating sweets. Serples was depressed about this for several days. The door of the auditorium suddenly made a loud bang. Professor Quirrell rushed into the auditorium, his big scarf tilted on his head, his face full of horror. Everyone stared at him and saw him walking crookedly to the center of the auditorium, panting and looking like he would faint at any time. Troll, in the underground classroom, you should know. Then he rolled his eyes and fainted. Sir Prius paused with his fork stuck in his apple pie. Oh, I've been so busy lately that I haven't gone to ask Professor Quirrell for questioning. However, he found the complete life of Tom Riddle in Durmstrang's library. Durmstrang is not as strict about dark magic as Hogwarts, so Serples easily found the information he was looking for. Tom is indeed Voldemort. Tom Marvolo Riddle rearranged the letters to form, I am Lord Voldemort. Voldemort, means, flying away from death, or, stealing death. He spent his entire life with the goal of death. Maybe he succeeded, but anyway, he disappeared since he attacked the Potter family eleven years ago. There is no evidence that he is dead, he just disappeared. At this moment when Serpilus' mind was wandering, the auditorium was already in chaos. The troll is a magical creature with no IQ. To round it off, it has no brain, but it has very high physical defense. It has rough skin and thick flesh that can be made into protective gear. According to the troll's IQ, it is obvious that it cannot enter Hogwarts on its own initiative, because Hogwarts has a layer of bottom-level defense to prevent some strange things from entering the castle and threatening the students. Life safety. After all, there is a forbidden forest behind the school. The forbidden forest is an abbreviation for the forest that is forbidden to enter, because it is a vast and extremely dark forest, and there is everything in it, it is true, there is everything. If we leave it alone, maybe tomorrow the underground classrooms of Hogwarts will be filled with giant spiders, and the observatory will become the territory of centaurs. Therefore, the appearance of the troll seems very unreasonable. Dumbledore obviously didn't know how unreasonable this was. In a low voice, he arranged for the prefects to take the students from each college back to the dormitory. The Slytherin student quietly followed his prefect on his way back to the lounge, but suddenly, Serple's head began to hurt again. But this was much better than the last time when he lost consciousness and fell to the ground. This time it was a sharp sting. It was only momentary, but it was enough to make Sepulus tense up and wake up completely. What's wrong? Draco helped Seppel stumble just now, with a hint of hidden worry in his beautiful eyes, have you been working too hard recently? Sepulus stood up straight, and then pressed his temples hard. It's okay, Sepulus breathed, then turned to look at the auditorium, looking in the direction where Quirrell fell just now, but now there was no one there. Sepulus was startled, where are people, but with Draco by his side, Sepulus could not stay any longer. He turned around and quickly followed Draco, returning to the Slytherin lounge with the large group. The appearance of the troll disrupted everyone's pleasant Christmas dinner. The girls complained that their makeup was wasted, and the boys were also aggrieved that their good leisure time had disappeared. Don't leave the lounge, the tall Slytherin prefect warned everyone, the troll appeared in the underground classroom, and the straight line distance between our dormitory and the underground classroom is not that far, so it is not safe outside. Quote. Everyone went back to the room calmly. Why are you back so early? Tom appeared next to Serples as soon as he came back. Didn't you say that there was a dinner party today and you would stay out a little late? To be honest, although this may not be a good description, Serples really felt that the young Tom Riddle waiting for him to come home every day was very much like a good wife. There was an accident, Serples took out the hard-boiled eggs he brought back to Natasha from his bamboo hat. A troll entered Hogwarts, and my head just hurt again. Quote, Natasha got out of her super luxurious snake nest, bit the egg, and went back with the boiled egg. Sepulus gave her a complicated look. But he didn't say anything. After all, it's winter, and snakes hibernate. Although Natasha was well raised and moved the snake's nest to a relatively warm place, Natasha was still tired and prepared to sleep after eating. You're not going to faint again, are you? Tom was very worried. There are trolls outside now. It's in danger if you go out. I think it shouldn't be. Surpris said hesitantly, how about I tie myself up when I sleep? 
The bed in the Slytherin dormitory was a rather luxurious four-poster bed, which met Serples's requirement of tying himself up. However, he asked Natasha to come out and help him get the key to the handcuffs on his right hand. Stay away. Didn't you expect that? There were all kinds of strange things in his luggage. I fell asleep with the shape of a big letter one night. There was no strange sleepwalking behavior, but he saw something else in his sleep. He saw himself walking, hurriedly heading towards the corridor on the fourth floor, but from the height of the perspective, Serpolis knew that the running person was not him. He was obviously an adult of this height. This man's movements were very fast, and his goal was clearly clear. Serples felt that his soul was trapped in that body, running in the now deserted corridors of Hogwarts. Sepulus saw his hand on the door, pulling the gate of opening, but saw Professor Snape with an expressionless face inside the door. What are you doing, Quirrell? Serples heard Professor Snape say. What a real dream. Serprius opened his eyes, but because his limbs were tied tightly, he could only spread himself flat like a pancake then raised his head and looked at the curtains on the four corners of the bed. He was not even going to ask for confirmation. He had now concluded that there must be something wrong with Quirrell. From the very beginning when he led him astray, there must be something wrong with Quirrell. Now it is better to prove Bo Kiluo's purpose. He is most likely for what is under the trap door. As for what the thing is, I don't know yet, and why are Quirrell's actions reflected in his dream of Surprius? Still don't know but it doesn't matter if I don't know. This kind of question that doesn't sound like the earthly world can be left to Wolf. So the next time he was beaten by Wolf and thrown into the bathtub, Serpris held up the snow-white tiles and asked Wolf if he knew what happened. Serpolis himself was born fair. Although he was busy in the orphanage and had to do a lot of work, he had a good foundation and could not get a tan. This was especially because his diet was not very regular, which added to his delicate whiteness. Diving in the pool with Wolf, who had fair skin, he looked particularly fair. During the long back and forth exchange, Sepples got a clear idea of Wolf's temperament. He was a cold hearted guy on the outside and hot on the inside. It was true that he was not good at words, but he saved the time of talking and went straight to action. For example, Sepulus was yelling that Wolf was not serious, and he didn't know how to do it until his whole body hurt so he just threw him into the herbal pool, which was not considerate at all. He just complained at that time. After all, he, Serpres, had already taken advantage of Wolfkin's teachings to him. How could he force himself to do anything else and press his arms and legs? Moreover, Wolf had no reaction after hearing his humming. It must have gone in the left ear and out the right ear. As a result, the next time he came back, after the routine teaching was over and he was pressed down and rubbed for a while, Surprius was splashing water in the medicinal bath, but Wolf came over with a bottle of medicinal wine. Come here and press your arms and legs. Wolf just frowned and thought for a moment, and then gave Sepulus several possibilities. Among them, Wolf said with some hesitation as the biggest possibility. The friend you are talking about, and the person on the other end who does these things, may share the same soul, or may have the same origin. Wolf's hand was still on Surprius' back as he spoke. This belongs to the category of black magic, but it is more mysterious. Sepulus nodded hesitantly. Him and Quirrell. No, he would rather think that this Quirrell is the adult version of Tom pretending to be. But after thinking for a moment, he pushed the idea out of his mind. Although he didn't want to say it, Quirrell let it go. He acted a bit too cowardly. To make him think that Quirrell was pretending to be the adult version of Tom, it would be better to make him believe that the adult version of Tom was possessing Quirrell. One word becomes a prophecy. Later, Sepples was lying on the hospital bed in the hospital wing, covered with a warm snow-white quilt that exuded bitter medicine, staring at the ceiling blankly, with a very complicated mood. Do I really have no prophetic talent? Sepulus thought angrily. I feel that I can take the place of Professor Trelawney in the West Tower. I feel that my predictions are more accurate than his. It was a dark and windy night. Yes, it's a dark and windy night. Draco came and knocked on Serple's bedroom door. What's wrong? Serple's was a little confused, thinking at this point, it's almost midnight, why haven't you fallen asleep yet? Draco's eyes were bright. Let's go to the astronomy tower. Sepulus, is what I'm looking at really Draco Malfoy? Draco didn't seem to realize Sepple's shock, but handed Sepple's a letter. 
Sepples took it and opened it in confusion. Inside was a letter from Charlie Weasley. Letter, a letter to Ron Weasley. The gist of the content is that a fire dragon will be transported and smuggled out of Hogwarts at midnight this Friday. Oh what day of the week is today? Oh, Friday is coming. Sepulus looked at the letter, and then at Draco who was quite, well, eager to try. Go and take a look. Draco had a strange excited smile on his face, I'm going to take a peek at the fire dragon. You go to Professor McGonagall to complain and ask her to severely deduct points from Gryffindor. Sepulus was somewhat silent, he felt that the last night out had turned on Draco's strange hobby. He nodded hesitantly, okay, it's not a big deal to go out for a run in the evening. If Draco wants to, he can just do it as a favor. Draco rushed to the observatory, while Sepulus drank two half-baked bottles of upgraded invisibility potions before going to find Professor McGonagall. Wolf is also a well-deserved pride of heaven, and his potions are also very powerful. When Sir Prius tentatively asked him about the purification of the acromantula venom, he quickly provided it to Sir Prius, found a solution. Although you can also go to Professor Snape for help with the same problem, but if you go to Professor Snape, you will definitely be scolded. Sepples didn't want to be scolded, so he decided to throw himself into Brother Wolf's broad and warm chest. It was indeed very warm. He had the courage to try winter swimming last time, but when he was shivering from the cold, Wolf hugged him tightly with his coat. It was super warm. Professor McGonagall was obviously shocked when she saw him, but she very gently bent over and asked Sir Prius why he was here. Professor McGonagall has a very good impression of Sepples. After all, Sepples has shown unparalleled talent in her transfiguration class, and now she doesn't find it difficult to follow the third year course, no teacher would dislike it. Such a talented student. Draco is gone, Professor. Serples said softly. He blinked and adjusted the angle of his head, trying to make his eyes look bigger and look more innocent. I heard that Draco is missing. Locko said that Harry and the others are going to the observatory to send off a fire dragon at midnight tonight. He scratched his nightgown nervously. I'm afraid that Draco will go out at midnight, and I don't worry about going to his room to look for him, but he's gone. Serples said pitifully. I'm worried that something will happen to him, Professor. Professor McGonagall nodded. She leaned down and kissed Sepulus gently on the cheek. Good boy, don't worry. She went back and put on a thicker cloak, and took out a thick scarf to wrap Serples, and then she took Serples' hand and walked to the observatory together. Before arriving at the observatory, just when they were still a few steps away from the stairs of the observatory tower, they already saw Filch, who was leading Harry and Hermione. Oh. Professor, I was planning to go find you, Filch smiled at Professor McGonagall, you little Gryffindor guy, he stayed up most of the night. He turned his head to look at Harry and Hermione behind him, smiling sinisterly. This is not a good thing. And Draco's voice rang out at this moment, with surprise and a little helplessness, Sepris. This was the rhetoric they had already thought of at the door of the dormitory. If you can't share the stolen goods, then you must insist that Harry and the others deliberately designed it to pluck themselves out. Mr. Malfoy, Professor McGonagall's expression was not good-looking. She looked at her two students and then at Draco, who was pale-faced. I think I need an explanation. Draco was very good at sizing up the situation and showed his weakness. I, I'm sorry, Professor. Harry on his sweet side looked at him and almost popped his eyes out. I picked up a letter. It said that Potter and the others would send a fire dragon away at midnight today. I believed it. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have run around casually. I should have given the letter to the professor first. Quote. As he spoke, he took out the letter from his clothes. Professor McGonagall took the letter and glanced at it briefly, then landed on Harry and Hermione with angry eyes. Filch's voice suddenly sounded in surprise. Oh, professor, professor, look. Look what good stuff I found, another student who doesn't sleep is also a Gryffindor. Professor McGonagall's expression turned grim. She turned her head, and everyone followed her. The person being dragged over by Filch was Neville Longbottom. He looked in a hurry. Harry, I've been looking for you. I heard Malfoy said he was coming to catch you. He said you had a fire dragon. But he only said half of what he said before he stopped because Professor McGonagall laughed angrily. I hope everyone will support it and subscribe more.